My name is Ebenezer Amwako and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. One of the ways God reached out to humanity is by raising vessels that can bear the witness of his reality. Most times God does not appear from Zion. When a dimension of God wants to appear, what he does is that he raises a man and he invests that dimension of his reality. So when you make contact with that man, you touch the very texture of God. Post came, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. If you see me and you interact with me long enough, you will touch God. So when a man is made, what happens is that he becomes a theater that manifests the dimensions of God. You are not a Christian because you can receive bread and wine from God. You are a Christian because you are supposed to be the revelation of God to your generation. You are not blessed because you receive the car. You are blessed because you are a manufacturer of everything God has to offer to your generation. Can you ask the Lord this morning, make me, 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 make me. You may be prospering, but there is darkness in your family. Meanwhile, you are the priest. You are the deliverer. Tell the Lord, make me this morning. Make me this morning. The making of man is the greatest dimension of blessing that Zion has to offer. Talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. I saw the vision. He said to make every member of the church, every member, it's not the pastors, it's not the shepherd, it's not the deacon. Every member of the church should become a carrier of God. Tell the Lord to make you this morning. That's when you will be truly blessed. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the throne. You know, because of the investment of prayer and revelation on this ground, the atmosphere is always volatile. As I speak to you now, the hand of God is already moving. The heavens, the heavens are beginning to open. The dew of the glory of God is already beginning to descend. We have not opened the scripture, but the ground is a fertile ground. He said, take off thy shoes, for where you are standing is holy ground. There are places you enter, nothing is done, but the hand of God is there. The Bible says so long as Samuel lived, the hand of God was perpetually against the Philistines. There are men that start in territories, and that place becomes the borders of heaven. Most of you are already receiving impartations. The visitations of heaven. It comes to you like a rushing mighty wind. Kaya. Salita matre kavas. Shetetetesh. 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 Palatataya tata. Obra satata. That the chariots of heaven may overtake you like a soup. That you may be carried in the wet winds of fire. In the name of Jesus, just stay calm where you are. If you can't, stop praying. Stop praying. There are three persons here that light, light, literal light will appear to you now. You will see it like lightning. Something is about to happen. You are about to catch a flight into the writings of your ordination. The things that God wrote concerning you before the foundations of the world. They are going to travel before you now like light. When Moses went to receive the law on the mountain, he said he saw the finger of God and a flame of fire went out of his finger and wrote the commandment. Light is about to appear to somebody. Oh, Shattaya! That it may be performed according to the counsel of 
your will. Say Lord, the career to us. Paradatas. Say the capelos. Bratatas. Bratatas. Thank you, Father. Like rain. Let it fall. Let it fall. I can see it. Yes. I'm seeing some white young women that are about to rise. See, there's a fire. I see this one's burning with fire. And their tongue is about to judge. Not just iniquity, but the powers of witchcraft. The powers of witchcraft. I see people burning with flames of fire. And so Holy Spirit, from the left to the right, from the front to the back, from the left to the right, from the front to the back, even to the, the minister's time. No, the ones that you are putting fire upon, the ones you are putting fire upon, Lord Jesus, touch them. Touch them. Touch them. Touch them. Flames of fire. Coming into fraternity with the seraphims of glory. Like fire. Like rain. By the time I'm rounding up, listen, something will happen to you. The turbine of your spirit will be activated. Most of you will become mobile prayer machines. The things you struggled with, a revival will begin in your spirit. You will pray on anything. The chaff of iniquity, the debris of dark installation, you will burn it off by fire. It's time for the armies of Zion to arise. The Mambri tree is already shaking. The spirit of God has gone ahead. The angelic host have moved. The armies on earth must arise. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. In the precious name of Jesus. Please be seated. Be seated for... Let me share the word of God for 30 minutes. And then we will we'll pray for another 10 minutes. When we look upon the pages of scriptures, God, God was manifested in several dimensions. He revealed himself to humankind through several dimensions of his essence and his reality. Some of you will live here today and you will become another man. <laughs> I want to share with you what I call the pathway of ordination. And as I share this, you will see the story of your life in what I'm sharing. Because the things I'm about to share to you, they are cast on iron. They cannot be uttered. It's like the laws of the medics and the patients that cannot be uttered. They are cast on iron. If you must fulfill destiny, you must follow this pathway. It's a trajectory of life and relevance. Everybody that amounted to anything in God, this is the path that they followed. Meanwhile, it's important for me to quickly let you know that God decided to give different callings to men, not because one is superior to the other. But it's because God expects that a complete work be done. If you want to know why the callings are different, then you need to understand the purpose for which it was given. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, the Bible said to some he gave to be apostles. To some he gave to be prophets. To some he gave to be evangelists. To some he gave to be pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints. 
for the work of the ministry until we all come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. So the reason for the ordinations in the fivefold is so that the believer can come to maturity. It is not because the apostolic office is superior to the pastoral office. But every one of them have specific assignments to carry out in order to bring the body to completeness. I said that to say this. The things I'm about to share this morning, they don't in any way invalidate the teachings that you have received before now. But for you to be whole, you must combine everything together so the body of truth can be complete and you can grow into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. By ordination, the evangelist cannot but have one kind of sight. The evangelist have what we call the hindsight. No matter how he tries, every time he looks at the scripture, he takes you back to the cross. The evangelist doesn't take you forward. He takes you back because you cannot live in the future unless you are traced back to the past. The root of your life is in your past. But the manifestation of your reality is in the future. So every time you meet an evangelist, he takes you back to the cross. Because without the cross, everything you are doing is old creation. And it cannot pass the veils of immortality. So in order for a man to have a place with God, his foundation must be traced to his backward. The cross. This is why the evangelist teaches about the cross, about salvation. Not because that's all he knows. But according to his wiring. Everything that comes out of him causes him to bring men back to a place where they can redefine their reality with God. The prophet gives foresight. So every time you interact with a prophet, he tells you what to do to succeed, how to move and take the next step of your life. No matter how the prophet tries, he cannot correctly enumerate salvation until somebody grows to maturity. That is why most prophetic ministry that think it's all about the prophetic view the, the most babes in the body of Christ. Because they think everything is about word of knowledge. They think everything is about word of wisdom. They think everything is about discernment of spirit. They don't understand that as newborn babes, you must desire the sincere milk of the word of God so that you may grow thereby. So people come every day is word of knowledge. So at the end of the day, they can receive so much from God, but they are babes. They are not relevant in the equation of God. Peter came in First Peter 2 verse 2, he said, as newborn babes. And when Paul came in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12, he said, whoever taketh me is a babe and is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He said, but strong meat belong to them who by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern between good and evil. So, even though the pastor is teaching, that's why the Bible says pastors and teachers. Because there is a point where you are giving the basics of, of salvation. There is another point where you are giving strong meat. That time you need a teacher. Because the teacher has insight. The evangelists have hindsight. The prophet has foresight. But the teacher has insight. He knows what to give you so that your muscles can be strong and your bones can bear weight. Because if you only have milk, Paul said you are a babe. You are unskilled in the world of righteousness. And the calamity of a babe is too. The first one is that so long as you are a babe, you can never have inheritance in the kingdom. In Galatians 4 verse 1, he said the heir, so long as he's a child, differeth nothing from the servant, even though he belongs of all. Therefore, the father places him under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. The second calamity of a babe is that he will be caught in the day of war. In Matthew chapter 2 verse 18, he said, Rachel was found crying for her children because they were not. The first casualty in the days of war are children. So you must of necessity be open to the ministry of a teacher so that he teaches you how to do business with strong meat because strong meat belongs to them who by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern Without discernment, a generation can be lost. I told them in Port Harcourt a few weeks ago, a whole generation, only three men were relevant with God. Isaiah prophesied 700 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. The guys were reciting the laws, the Torah, 
and they became political men. So they had two high priests. One of them was carrying religious revelation. The other one was relating with the governors. And when Jesus showed up, walking bodily in the territory, no one could recognize him because there was no discernment. Only two, three people knew the Messiah. Meanwhile, the prophecy is what they were living for. The Bible spoke of Anna, the prophetess. He said, since her husband died, she was in the synagogue for 80 and 4 years and she was fasting and praying. So when Jesus showed up, she knew that this is the salvation of Israel. The Bible spoke of Simeon. He said, Simeon was praying. When they brought the baby, the infant Jesus to the temple, he said, Simeon went by the Spirit. Nobody was telling him what to do. That's a man of discernment. He was praying. The heavens changed. The energy changed. The balances were altered. He knew that the prophecy is about to be fulfilled. So he began to look. Where is it? And he saw a light. He walked. When he saw the infant Jesus, he said, this is the salvation of Israel. At the age of eight, how were you able to know by what integer did you discern that this little babe is the salvation that was being waited for for 700 years? Discernment. John, the Bible said in Luke 1 80, was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. And when he came out, he saw Jesus coming. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Behold, how did you know this guy was your cousin? You were with him all the time. At some point, when he was separated, discernment began to come. So when he saw Jesus, he didn't see his cousin. He saw the Messiah. So the Bible says, strong meat, it belongs to them who by reason of youth have exercised their senses to discern. It is a teacher that will give you the equipping for discernment. And then we have the ministry of the apostle. The apostle have what we call long sight. Every time an apostle talks to you, he cannot help it. He wants to establish Jesus as the cornerstone of your life. So apostles talk about government. We talk about kingdom. We talk about eternity. Your life has no reference unless it can be traced to a spot in eternity future. Jesus said, when they appear, he shall give them white stones. You know what a stone is? A stone is not a block. A stone is part of the infrastructure of the new Jerusalem. But before you become a stone, you must live a life in this world that God has the liberty to chisel you so that you can fit into the corners where your destiny is relevant. You see this building, there are many blocks. All of them were created the same. But when the building was about to be erected, some were divided in the middle. Because for you to fit into the corner, you must be divided. That's where government comes. For you to be a foundation, you must be toughened. For you to be a deadly tear, you must be toughened. So, apostles begin to teach you the significance of your dealings. So, you understand why every time there's calamity, it's about you. Every time there's accusation, it's about you. Your second name is Trias. What is happening to you is that your block is being taken. Because in Zion, you are foundation. Another person can be another part of the block. But you, in Zion, you are foundation. You can come to church and every time it's complaining about your character. You cut this off. You cut this off. You are a cornerstone. With that oblong dimension, you can't fit into the building. The office of the apostle brings you into relevance in eternity future. That's why we talk deep. That's why we talk kingdom. That's why we talk government. And the message of the apostle is not necessarily captured in the Bible. It is revealed in his teachings. Because himself will be chiseled by God. And when he becomes a tried stone, that time he can bear a kind of witness that is not among men. And that is why every time God wants to even ship dispensation, the only people that have the credentials to bring the church to another dispensation are apostles. By reason of their dealing. They sustain the flexibility to carry the church from one level to another. When they are doing that, the whole world will persecute them. But they don't care. They have become dead men. An apostle can get up and tell you, that God said this time is reviver. You can accuse him, you can insult him, it doesn't matter. That's a dead man talking. The life that he lives now is no longer his. It is the life of the Son of God that gave himself for him. The reason is because he has stepped everything beyond the borderlines of creation and he has found out that we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence. So it doesn't matter. See, your own breakthrough can be a car. The breakthrough for an apostle is his ability to receive the signals of heaven. Because the responsibility of his life is to bring the church from one level of encounter to another. From one level of dealing to another. From one dispensation of glory to another. But if you listen to only an apostle, you may destroy your life. 
because you who is supposed to be a politician, you can pack your load and go and live at the cave. Itai, itai. You are the spirit of ocean. You are glorious beyond this creature. Eternity. You are the spirit of the Because I saw a young man that has a full hair, and somehow I saw oil dripping from your head. Oil, oil dripping from his head. That means this one I speak about, he has an apostolic calling. So as I began to speak about the office of the apostle, his oil began to move. Because what I was doing was that I was putting fire on the oil that was congealed. And right now, everybody that has an apostolic DNA here. I speak by the Spirit of God. I say, let the anointing be concentrated upon you. Holy Spirit, touch them. Saletesh, Karatatas, Fariana Tanesk, Brazil, Frakatian, the Sibras. I saw a young man with full hair. Find that one for me. The pathway of ordination. Catalana track. It is not healthy to only listen to an apostle. Hi. See, see, see. There is fire. I'm seeing fire. They are sprinkling fire. They are sprinkling fire. They are sprinkling fire. I'm seeing some strange sight in the spirit. They are sprinkling fire on people. Somebody is about to begin to dance a strange kind of dance. You can't control your body. You are being launched into the angelic realm. I see light coming upon somebody. You will lose coordination now. As I speak, let that dimension come upon you. Salataita, Verakidos, Katat, Beratatata, Radatata, Skapaya. Hey, hey, I call for that dimension. I call for that dimension. I call it for. I call it for. Listen, the waters have been stirred. I saw a vision just now. A young lady, I saw you. You carried your mother in the spirit and you threw her into the water. So what's happening now is that you are standing in for your mother. And I see a condition that has to do with the kidney. And right now as I speak by the spirit, I command, let the anointing travel in the direction of your mother. And let affliction be tamed. Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, I make it happen. I make it happen. I make it happen. Sarabandra Paras. Zetetedesh. Rakido Seriata. Paradantra Kabash, 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 Kabash. Many things are already happening. Somebody on the right hand side here, listen. I just saw somebody handed over a khaki to a young lady. And as I speak, I release the anointing in that direction. Father, the one who is implicated, I release it in the name of Jesus. Rakavondre Paraskibosh. Saila Telino Rahaski Branda Kalatas Pranika Zindra Patatiska Zovrendre Tatatino Sandre Kila Paradiasto Ratete Shetar Rakila Pariska Paridosco 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 
Listen. Listen. There are three of you here that have a prophetic destiny. Your ears are popping open in the spirit. The people I speak about, you have been feeling sensations. You don't know what it means. But as I spoke in tongues, what I did was to create an activation. Kelasino, Garianda Finasca, Letrapira Sarianda Paras, Ragatidas, Aranda Sebretagos, Delegatina Sagatias, Rita Tata, Rita Tata, Rita Tata, Rita Tata, Rita Tata, I'm seeing, I'm seeing in the spirit. There's somebody that has pain on your right knee. I just said something like a pain on your right knee. As if he's about to even swear. As I speak right now, I challenge that darkness. That chain that is clogged around your knee. Break in the name of Jesus. Oh yeah. Shai, shai, shai. Hey! There's somebody on the left side of this hall. You are feeling a pain and an itching sensation. Somewhere in your right eye. You are the one? It's living now. Shatetesh. Terekate. Parina, 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 parina. Right now, I release the anointing. I challenge that operation of darkness out of him in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I've seen a vision. I've seen a vision. I've seen a young man that is bearded. And I saw you kneel down three days ago. And you are praying to God. For the supernatural. You say, oh, but it's not you. I know you. <laughs> you are telling the Lord, I'm tired of sensation. I want something tangible. Run out. You are about to be commissioned. Seterina Katadito. Shele, Shele. Shele. Shele, Tatina. Lift your hand, brother. As I minister to him, it will touch everybody that is implicated. Right now, Holy Spirit of God, Telete Tatalita, what he desires, I don't only release it upon him. You sent your word to Jacob, enlightened upon Israel. Holy Spirit, take! He spreads right now. Every one of you, take in the name of Jesus. Take in the name of Jesus. Katerina. Bradonzo break the vadis. Chaya tarata. Tatara. Mandoria takazizas. Tazizo senera tekaish. Touch Lord. I'm seeing somebody on this middle row. You have something under your right leg like a blister. And it's causing you pain under your right leg. The Lord is taming things. He's taming things. Thank you Father. You may be seated. Sit down. Sit down. See, you don't know the effect of your intercession, your commitment, and your revelation. The heavens over you are open. The evangelists have hindsight. So he takes you back to the cross. That's where you begin your journey from. The prophet have foresight. So he gives you day-to-day -day direction. That's why he's kids. Are words of knowledge, words of wisdom, discernment of spirits. The teacher has insight. That's why he gives you strong meat. And by then, your senses can be exercised. The apostle has long sight. Remember, long sight means outside the context. So he takes you beyond earth into eternity. But the pastor has oversight. So it's the pastor that will tell you everything that every other person should tell you so that there is balance in your life. Sometimes you come to church, the pastor is telling you, read your books. You think he's kana. You think he's not a spiritual person. Without him, you will destroy yourself. The pastor is the one that tells you how to take your job seriously. He tells you about the diligence and the excellency of labor. Sometimes he catch that sister so she doesn't enjoy herself. They are angelic operations. Sometimes, the pastor can come to church and throw other days teaching you about dressing and etiquette. You say, this guy is not spiritual. What kind of thing is that? You don't know where God is taking you. Your ministry may be before kings, but you will not have the earth they
to operate at that level. A pastor can show up and teach you how you need to relate with family. You think he's uh, about, oh, I saw an angel. When you get married, after three months with your anointing, your family will scatter. So for God to give you the blueprint of your destiny and to carry you through the pathway of ordination, an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher must speak into your life. The reason your pastor sent me to come here is because you need an apostolic investment. It's not because what he's teaching you is not as spiritual as what I'm teaching. It's about balance, maturity, and stability. The final phase of my training was on this same campus in this same church. I had been trained by virtually every office, but God brought me to my friend. And for one year, eight months, I was an usher here. That's not Bible study. We call that one the Z coordinate. The first time I showed up, I said, what is the meaning of this? For God's sake, I'm a master's degree holder. This young man is still in, this, in school. That pride element is why I would not have been where I am today. So God used him to chisel me. If Apostle told me to be an usher, I would say, thank you, Jesus. But he brought me to Reverend Hughes. Because I will see Apostle up there. And by pride and arrogance, I will see Reverend Hughes down here. My eye was defective. I did not have the eye of honor. And meanwhile, one of the greatest precursors of impartation and spiritual reception is the eye of honor. So God brought me here. I was an usher for one year, eight months. It was when that phase of training was rounding up that everything began to speed up in my life. You are mighty on your throne. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. Cry out, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. Selig on the Fatira Abadask. Ligdo Vrahas Gilo Brahandala Gazido Kranda Faradiga Sastish. Baranda Sundre Kadiaska. Kaliska Dijala Astara Batondre Katadidos. It's not everything you receive cognitively. Certain things are transferred to you as a body or spirit. And some other things are chiseled into you through process and dealing. I received a kind of education I have not received anywhere. That's when pride died. I say I'm a master's degree holder. This guy is an undergraduate. The Holy Ghost say, in the equation of heaven, we don't have certificate there. <laughs> Bachelor's degree is not in heaven. So the parameter you are judging by, we don't recognize it in heaven. I say, these guys are on campus. I'm a graduate. He said, yes, uh, this kind of university is not in heaven. The one we have in heaven is called the school of the spirit. <laughs> and he has no regard for every jurisdictions and parameters. So I stayed until after eight months, it became normal for me to carry the offering basket. I will even be doing it and having fun. I didn't notice I was an usher anymore. I found myself in a company of wise men. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. They are the instructors that God gives you alongside the Holy Spirit in order for you to fulfill eternal ordination. We don't have time, so I will just run through the pathway of ordination quickly. The first on the part of ordination is what we call the betting of vision. The betting of vision. You can be on head and live for 80 years and then when you are in church because you have been there for 35 years or for 60 years out of respect they can obey you as an elder. If you have no vision you are a babe. With all humility. I'm saying this with the backings of scriptures, not arrogance. The Bible said Moses was in Egypt. He was 40 years old. But as far as heaven's calendar was concerned, Moses was a child. The moment Moses sustained body for ordination, instantly the Bible said when Moses was come of age, that was at the age of 40. <laughs> so Moses came of age at the age of 40. He said when Moses was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the pleasure that was in Egypt, which is but for a city. Why? Because he saw him that was invincible. 
Meanwhile, at the age of 17, Timothy saw vision. So Paul made him the bishop of Ephesus. So the time you come of age in the spirit is when the vision of your destiny is born. A man who has not bettered the reason for which he is born will be a child at the age of 99. So you can't walk on the corridor of ordination unless you bet your vision. The moment your vision is bettered, it begins to create laws to govern your life. The day you know that you are a prophet, that day it will become a taboo for you to sleep through the night. It will become a taboo for you to eat from Monday to Sunday. The reason is not because it's doctrine. Your vision now begins to set a law upon your heart. And on the strength of that law, you can become relevant in time and in eternity. So when you see people living a strange kind of life, it is not because their lifestyle is the blueprint for everybody. It's because they have found their own vision. And on the strength of that which they found, a new government was established upon their lives. The Bible spoke about John. He was born to the family of a priest. And on the strength of that, he was supposed to become a priest. But suddenly, something happened to him and he realized that he was a prophet. So in Luke 180, the Bible said John was in the wilderness. Not because if you don't want to be a priest, go and live in the wilderness. When he saw the vision, that was the place where his training was. So that place, even though he was living on wild honey and locusts, dressed in camel skin, that place became a waterbed for him. Because for him to be able to trap the dimensions of heaven that was coming to his heart as a vision, he must be schooled. And he was there, the Bible said, until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. Meanwhile, Jeremiah was also a prophet. And he was born to the family of a priest. Jeremiah chapter 1 from verse 1 to 5. He didn't know. So he was following his father and doing the priestly oblation until vision appeared to him from heaven. And the day vision came, his lifestyle changed. He said, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I ordained you to be a prophet. That means, even though it is right to obey your father, and you are going in the direction of priesthood, and there is nothing wrong with it, this one is not consistent to the handwriting of ordination. You will walk here for 90 years. When you come to Zion, there will be no blocks to build your portion of Zion. I didn't send you to earth, as Apostle Aramay will tell us, to be creative. I sent you to be yielded. The creative one is the Holy Ghost. So, you become creative to the degree that you are yielded. Every time a man is rebellious, what he's doing can be a mighty invention, but it's not creativity. What is the vision that God has put in your heart? You can be part of an assembly like this, and God give you a vision in the vision. So, when you are serving as an usher, you are not serving because pastor put you there. The reason many people are rebellious is because they think what they are doing is pastor's job. They have no vision. When you know that that is what God wants you to do in order for the service to be complete, you will be doing it with dignity like the guy on the microphone. Because he is playing his part, you are playing your part. God does not reward us because we are on the mic. God rewards us because we fulfill our quota of the work in Zion. That's why I say woe unto him who is at ease in Zion. You are not rewarded because you are the one preaching. You can be scrubbing the table, but you have the highest reward because you did your own 100%. Meanwhile, the guy who is preaching can be in, 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 in the football match yesterday. Hey! Hey! And then his club loses. And he comes home, he's angry till morning. So he came and carried Bible and came and preached haphazardly. Meanwhile, you prayed in tongues and came and you cleaned the chairs. You received the reward more than the pastor that morning. You were mighty on your throne. You reign, you reign, you reign, you reign, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. So the first thing vision does for you is that it defines your essence. It is vision that defines your essence. I'm not doing what I'm doing because I love it so much. I was told that I'm an apostle to the nations. This is why even though try I come now, I don't have a choice. At this point, I cannot say I'm not doing again. It's an error. I saw something that has defined my essence. So the Bible says, whoever lays his hand on the plow and turns back is not fit for the master's job. All of us will come to church. Five of us will be fair. But we will not be defined because we are beautiful. 
and we will not marry because we are beautiful. The reason you will marry a banker, another one will marry a prophet, another one will marry a politician is vision. It defines your essence. So Jeremiah was going in the direction of priesthood, but vision told him, you are a prophet. He may be at the age of 30, I don't know, but whatever age it was that he was in at the time, was no longer relevant what he was doing. The moment he realized, it became an error for him to be a priest. Visions will define your essence. The second thing that vision will do for you is that he will ensure that your life must be spiritual. If you see a man who is carnal, he has no vision. Vision will force you to be a spiritual man because you cannot create vision in your head. The only way you see vision is that the patterns on the mount must be revealed to you. So he said to Moses in Exodus 25 verse 9 and verse 40, he said, ensure that you build according to the pattern that is on the mount. So the creating of the tabernacle was not a function of Moses' creativity. He would have built hundreds of them, it would be wrong. So everything you do becomes spiritual to the degree that it is captured within the confines of your vision. The borderline of your vision is the scope of your spirituality. Because it is vision that forms the boundary of your spirituality. Noah was living in the fear of God all his life. But the Bible did not recognize it. Until the Bible said, when God spoke to Noah, Noah moved with reverence. There were many other things Noah was doing. But the quality of his spirituality was defined by his reverence. Because reverence was the infrastructure upon which the betting of his vision stood on. Noah may be a very skillful man. Noah may be a worshiper. We didn't capture that. He said, when God speak, Noah moved by reverence. It was on the strength of reverence that his vision was born. So reverence became the heaviest molecule of Noah's spirituality. And the only way Noah could achieve the feat that he achieved was because what? It was revealed to him. In the book of Genesis, chapter 6, from verse 11 to verse 18, you will see how God was telling him to make the ark of a gopher wood. Nothing Noah did was because he was a technocrat. Everything he did was because he saw it. The way you preach what you preach, the way you serve how you serve, all of them is a function of the vision that you saw. If you don't have a vision, it will be difficult to be spiritual because it will determine the direction that you should go. You can be singing because you are skillful. Your voice will not pierce through Zion. You see, this is why most times before we come to sing, we wear high heel like this. Now, there's nothing wrong. The Bible says, make garments unto Aaron for beauty and for glory. But if that becomes your priority, it's because you have no vision. Meanwhile, another worshiper comes to sing and he knows because when the blueprint of his destiny was given to him, God told him, every time you sing, I will baptize people in the Holy Ghost. So what he sees is not his dress. What he sees is whether people will be what? Baptized in the Holy Ghost. Because the reason he's singing is for baptism in the Holy Ghost to be possible. God may tell him, every time you sing, I will heal the sick. So he will not judge his, his worship that day by the quality of his voice. He will judge his worship that day by the testimonies that emanate from that worship. So every time he worships, he's waiting to see whether somebody went home and said, God told me. Then he knows I'm the one. The pastor can come and say, yes, you know, if you're in this church, you will move in word of knowledge. He's a lie. The person singing is the one with the key. So your spirituality is now defined by the degree to which you align with your vision. When you see a carnal man, there's no vision. Vision also ensures that whatever you do in time is secured eternally. So eternal security is born out of vision. See, Jesus was with the disciples for many years. His goal was to bring salvation and to build the church so that through that umbrella of the church, the purposes of God can be fulfilled. But there was no way Jesus could, could bet the church. He carried them from one location to another. He preached this gospel. He took them to the mountain. They could do it. Until the day that somebody saw flashes from heaven. They now say, who do men say, I, the son of man, I am. And that day, somebody caught a vision. So with the whole preaching of Jesus on the mountain, in the cave, in the house, they tore the roof. He could not bet the church. Because Jesus knows that if something is not born from the spirit, the devil can corrupt it in time. If Jesus came and told them about the church and they built it, 
The devil would have compromised it. The reason the gates of hell shall not prevail against it is not because the apostles are strong. It's because upon this revelation that came from the Father. So the foundation was in heaven. So when Paul was trying to destroy the church, he said it is hard to kick against the bricks. What you are fighting against has its root in heaven. So God can tell you you are a businesswoman. Even if it's pure water, you will be a millionaire. The whole witches in your village can gather and say it will not work. They are joking. That thing you are doing has its root in heaven. If you want to destroy that thing, travel to heaven and destroy it. Because until the foundation be shaken, the righteous has something to do. <laughs> until the foundation be destroyed, the righteous has something to do. The only time you can deal with the righteous is when you destroy the foundation. So God makes sure a man does not begin to live until he first of all catches a fight in heaven. That's why even the tabernacle is viewed according to the pattern. So till tomorrow, till tomorrow, every time anything is caught in heaven, there's no way you can destroy it in time. That's why even men of purpose, you can't kill them. The Bible said they came, they carried Jesus, they took him to the cliff of the mountain. When they reached the cliff and they saw, they have exercised all their power. The Bible said Jesus walked in between them. See, that time, that's when you compose yourself. When they brought him to the cliff, he now stood like this. And as he turned, his purpose paused time. Because you can't kill him. He said, this commandment have I learned of the Father. I have the power to lay down my life and to take it up again. You don't kill them. What is powering them has its root in eternity. The power of vision. When you catch a vision and you know it, then you are willing to give up everything for it to be fulfilled. Because you know your relevance is not a function of how you look. Your relevance is a function of how your vision looks. Your vision is the beautiful one, not you. Have you seen men of God? Some of them are talking like, hey, Lord Jesus is good. Meanwhile, people want to touch them. Some will cut their body and carry it to the house. You don't love that man. His vision is beautiful. So it overshadows his ugliness. Meanwhile, people that have no vision, they spend all their money trying to look good. That is because they've not seen anything in Zion. A man of vision can stroll here with slippers and jeans and shirt. And everybody, hey, 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 what are you looking? You don't, I tell you, if his twin brother comes that look exactly like him, you will not like him. So what you are admiring is not the man, it's the glory of his vision. This is what Lucifer did not understand. Lucifer was in heaven. He thought that his beauty was about him. He didn't know that his beauty was the quality of service that he was rendering in heaven. The Bible said concerning Lucifer, he said, thou that sealed the psalm, in Ezekiel 28, from verse 12, he said, Thou that sealed the song. That means, if you study it in the Message Bible, he said, Lucifer was the compendium of wisdom and beauty. So, everything about beauty in the world that were created before the new earth was created, beauty and wisdom were articulated within the borders of Lucifer's constitution. So, if you wanted to know the wisdom of God, approach Lucifer, it emits like radiation. If you wanted to see the beauty of God, approach Lucifer, it emits like radiation. Meanwhile, he didn't know that his beauty was not because he was beautiful externally. His beauty was the kind of service he was rendering in heaven. The Bible said, from the day of thy creation, thy tabs and thy tablets were indeed. So the glory is not how the, the, the organ was created in his body. The glory is that he was the governor of worship in heaven. If he fails to bring worship to heaven, they look become useless. He said he was covered with ten precious stones. And everything you and I call jewelry today is what Lucifer wore as his garment. You know he's a spirit. But Lucifer was also the governor of the earth realm. So he needed to be clothed with things that can make him walk on earth. The first earth that was destroyed. So he was covered with stones. You could look at Lucifer and you see diamond. You see sapphire. If it turns like this, you see gold. So the guy thought it was about beauty. The Bible said you were in Eden from the day of thy creation. The anointed cherub that covered it. He said you moved to and fro in the midst of the coals of fire. That means Lucifer was at the same time a cherubim and a seraphim. 
Because it is the cherubims that cover the glory of God. It is the seraphim that preserve the holiness of God. And the only way the seraphim is able to preserve the holiness of God is that it moves to and fro in the midst of the coals of fire. So the fire purifies it. Suddenly he felt it was important because it was beautiful. And when he wanted to ascend his throne, he said iniquity was found in you. So he was cast from the mountain of God. He lost service and instantly, till tomorrow the Bible said, Lucifer can appear as an angel of light, but is no longer beautiful. Relevance had been taken away because he lost sight of vision. His duty in heaven was to serve God. He was the governor of sound. He was the governor of light because he was called the light bearer. He was the custodian of beauty and, and, and wisdom. He was the governor of the first earth. But he lost everything because he lost sight of vision. The reason most of us become proud is because we think we are beautiful. But well, don't worry. I thank God that here you are trained and discipled well. Have you seen young ladies that were Miss Beauty? They are walking like this. Until they become 38 years old. So their arrogance make them disdain men. If you look at them, they are like angels. But when you come close, their arrogance will dance you away from them. So they walk like this. Until they are 38 years old. Then they come to church and attend every VG. Lord, take me as I am. <laughs> you reign, you reign, you reign. So Paul discerned them correctly. He said, let the beauty, let your beauty, let your beauty. Not be in your modest apparel. Be in your modest apparel, rather. Not in your flamboyance. He said, like Sarah, call your husband Lord. The way Sarah called Abraham Lord. It is true that your beauty, that even if your, father, your husband is an unbeliever, you can convert him. That means your vision and expression can be more potent than the gospel you preach. But that, that opportunity was only given to women. You can convert your unbeliever husband. Because you have caught a vision. People don't understand. The pathway of ordination, it begins with vision. How much of your vision have you apprehended? You don't come to church because they follow you up. The pastor can even decide to say, go, I don't need you anymore. You will kneel down and beg. Not because you don't have anything to do, but you have seen something. Arrogance. They can say, go, we don't need you again. You will beg. Because in this world, you don't do things because you can do them. You do things because you should do them. And the things you should do are only within the boundary of your vision. So you can come and say, now I'm an apostle. Even if he doesn't want, I can start my church. It will work. You can have a church of 100,000 people. Heaven don't know it. Jesus told them in Ephesus, the reason for which the church was planted was lost. He said, I come quickly and I'm coming to remove your candlestick. So you can be doing activity on earth, but there's no can do in heaven. You can be an apostle. You are going everywhere. And then they say, no, go. They separate you from where God planted you. And then you now say, for what? what? And then they preach for me. And then, and then you go. You will preach like that for 90 years. When you go to heaven, your radar stopped reading the day you departed from where you were planted. This is why we don't move until we have seen. We don't move because we can move. We move because we should move. Our strength, our value is to the degree that we are consistent with heaven. Elohim Adonai. Oh, I have five more minutes. He said, body. When you carefully and accurately articulate your vision, then the next pathway is open to you. It's called the path of process. <laughs> I always share this story. Don't laugh. I know you have heard it a couple of times. My friend came to me and he said, Jesus appeared to me and said, I'm the Apostle Paul of this generation. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Will you doubt the voice of God? And Jesus would have even appeared to him. But you will never become until you follow the path of process. Paul the Apostle saw Jesus. He said, when it pleased the Father to reveal the Son in me, I conferred not with flesh and blood, but I went to Arabia. It was in Arabia that his tools were given to him. He had seen Jesus, but he didn't jump to pray because he saw Jesus. Have you seen people that travel to heaven? 
and the next thing it becomes their gospel. <laughs> the guy is talking about hey, hell is real. But the next five seconds where you see him is a depiction of hell. Some people are telling you give your heart to Christ. You give your heart to Christ. They are the same people that will rape you. They believe what they are preaching but there was no process. So God was not installed into them like an operating system. They talk by gift. They operate by gift but there is no process. The beauty of a man in the dispense of the counsel of God is the extent to which he obeys process. This is why glory is revealed to the degree of death. A man can never manifest glory unless he dies to flesh. And it is in the altar of process that flesh is dealt with. So what process does is that it ensures that the manifestation of your vision conforms with the dictates of heaven. Because God can call you a prophet, but you can come on earth and become an apostle. God can call you a teacher, but you can come on earth and become an evangelist. Because when you check, you are still preaching, but when you check, it's like the evangelical ministry, there's more money and honor there. You were teaching in one small location for five years. Then one day you escorted your friend for a meeting. And then when you came to the airport, a seven-year-old lady brought flour. And then when they collected the flour, you are going your normal way. You think you want to stroll to the meeting. You now see four messages jeeps. And then 30 protocols stand with black suits. They open it. Usher you people inside. And they are moving with double traffic. And as you reach the meeting, they open the, the, the way they even park. For five years, you will not forget. <laughs> And then as we were coming down, the guy on the stage is announcing, the moment we are waiting for is finally here. Evangelist has come. Then you now went to me and say, Lord, why did you make me a teacher? And then you wake up and say, I am an evangelist. In the name of the Lord. I am. See, that's what you do when most times when you cry for cars. There's nothing wrong with it. But have you checked with heaven? Let me show you something that will bring a balance that will amaze you. There is no prosperity gospel you would have taught John the Baptist that we account to anything in his life. Because so long as the dictates of his ordination was concerned, he needed to be taught in the wilderness. So every time you bring John into abundance, you are robbing him of ordination. Now it will be an error for John to come and say, everybody that wants to know God must be poor. That is witchcraft. According to the kind of ordination he has, the process for him was to be separated from pleasure and from humankind. The guy was going to look into the spirit realm and unravel prophecies until he reaches 700 years prophecy. There was no way distraction could be allowed, not even wealth. So when he showed up, they said, who are you? He didn't say, I am John. I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. That guy had traveled from time. He knows the region of eternity. Why are you baptizing? The one that sent me, the same said unto me, upon whomever the spirit descend and rest is the Messiah. Who talks like that? Is a man of process. So prosperity gospel is not for John. The only gospel that is for John is the gospel of suffering. The Bible says he learned obedience through the things he suffered. That's a kind of the gospel. Jesus' life is a revelation of different dimensions of the dealings and operation of God. That's why the Bible called him the author and the finisher of our faith. So there's a kind of faith that accepts suffering as a training school. He said he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Meanwhile, another person can be destined for greatness, but he listened to poverty until he stepped out of ordination in a bid to please God because he thinks when you are suffering, you are pleasing God. Did you read about Lazarus? In Luke 16, when Lazarus went to heaven, the Bible says Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. That means in the generation of Lazarus, Lazarus was supposed to walk in the fullness of the Abrahamic blessing. So in heaven, he's in the lineage of Abraham. But unfortunately, when Lazarus was on earth, the Bible says he was a poor man. So the reason Lazarus was poor was not because that was part of his process. He was supposed to be rich, but maybe he had the gospel of suffering too much, so he blinded his eyes. It was when he went to heaven, he started enjoying. So, how do we balance it? When we teach, we teach prosperity as a standard. 
But in case you heard God and you say, go to the wilderness, there's nothing wrong with it. If you are sure you heard God. Every one of us will prosper. The Bible said, I wish above all things that thou mightest prosper and be in hell, even as your soul prospered. He said, tell them that are rich in this world to be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God that give it to every man liberally that they may enjoy. So prosperity is the will of God and it's, it's a cost to be poor. But there is a place in God where the dictates for your ordination demands that you go through suffering in order to achieve the mandate of your destiny. That is not a sin. So when you exercise faith, don't be zealous. Be revelational. You reign, you reign, you reign. You reign, you reign, you reign, God. Oh, you are mighty on your throne. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. They use that scripture erroneously. So when you stand before the sick, you say, I can do all things. When you, no, what Paul meant was different. Because he said, I have learned how to abound and to abase. I am Lord of circumstance. That means at some point in Paul's life, he went through the college of suffering. At some point in his life, he went through the college of wealth. So he knows the difference. And none of them moves him anymore. That's a tried stone. I'm Lord of circumstance. And if you check the gospel of Paul, he taught prosperity as a blueprint. But he knows suffering. That's ordination. Another thing process does is that it validates your calling. You will become fake if you are not a man of process. It may not be immediately, but not too long you will see it. Most of the prophets that you see today, they began genuinely with the spirit of righteousness. But they did not understand that in the prophetic corridor, there are two parts. There is a part of righteousness and there is a part of Balaam. Balaam was not a man of process. The Bible says, whoever he causes is cost. Whoever he blessed is blessed. When Balaam came to prophesy, he called himself a man that sees with his eyes open. So you can sense arrogance within his chambers. I, Balaam, the son of Beowah, the man that sees with my eyes open. Oh, that's not part of the job they called you for. Why is it important? No process. No process. They come to professor. They say, young man, listen, be very careful. I talk to governors. Don't waste my time here. Oh, God. They didn't ask the people you talk to. They say, challenge. They say, come as a prophet and handle it. But when you hear like that, no, there's no process. Watch them. After a while, after a while, they will go into the error of Bela. After a while, they will go into the way of Bela. Then they will go into the doctrine of Bela. They will begin to teach us at the writing. So they tell you is boldness in Jesus. The last time we read the Bible, that was arrogance, not boldness. But they are not men of process. So even though they know they are prophets, they will never enter into the fullness of ordination. Process is one of the major things that validates your calling. Jesus showed up and John began to write. First John said, before I am able to give you the credentials of this personality, I need to journey back into the beginning. Because you can't introduce him unless you have been granted access to the foundation, the cradle of time. He said, in the beginning was the word. This is the personality he wants to introduce. The world was with God and the world was God. John chapter 1 verse 1 to 5. He said, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. He said, in him was life. The life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. Four credentials that nobody before him ever had. All the prophets that lived, Abraham, Elijah, none of them had those credentials. So Paul himself showed up. He said, God who had sounded times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, but has in this last day spoken unto us by his son. And then he said, Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. This is the kind of posterior introduction they gave Jesus Christ.
In John's introduction, there are four major things. One, he said he was the keeper of the gate of the beginning. That means time and creation owes his existence to him. Secondly, he said he was with God and he was God. That means everything you read about God, this man is God. Meanwhile, the Hebrew guy believes there is only one God and he is in heaven. How can a man show up and say this is God? It's, it's blasphemy. You can be killed for it. But Jesus came They said this man is equivalent to the Elohim. And they didn't stop there. They said, in case you have a hope of living for eternity, it is your fraternity with this man that we grant it to you. Because he said in him was life. The life was the light of man. In case you can never manifest anything about God, even if you did it before or you will do it in the future, it's still because of your fraternity with this man. That means there is nothing about God and creation that can exist apart from him. No wonder Paul came and said the fullness of the Godhead dwell in him bodily. But this same Jesus with the boisterous introduction, after he was introduced, as if that was not enough, he was coming to the Jordan River. And John stood up, John that everybody revered. Remember, there was no prophet in Israel for 400 years. It was called the age of darkness. So John was the first prophet that generation knew. Everything they read about prophets and the prophetic was defined by John in that generation. So they revered John like a god. Even the Pharisees came to John and he said, you go away, brood of vipers. You can't challenge John. He was a god in his generation. And then Jesus was strolling to the Jordan River and John stood up and said, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Ah! When John speaks like that, the whole universe will turn their attention to you. It's just like they hold you on Facebook now and Donald Trump say, Fear this man. If this man go to any country, the president will be the one to receive him. Because you don't know what fear this man is. It could be that all the atomic bomb that U.S. has, this is the man that creates it. Because you don't know. Because a mighty man say what? Fear this man. If that mighty man fear this man, then if you don't fear him, you are foolish. So when John pointed Jesus and said, now, when you call the Lamb of God, it means all the prophecy before time and calls on him. So everything the Jewish people believe in is the one walking to him in bodily form. If you believe in resurrection, this is the resurrection. If you believe in healing, this is healing. If you believe in mercy, this is mercy. If you believe in power, this is power. Because everything about the prophets and the law, this is the man that is carrying it. And then this man shows up and then he came and knelt down before John. I don't understand what's happening. I thought they say you are creator. I thought they say you are the son of God. I thought they say you are God. I thought they say you are life. I thought they say you are the lamb. The man was going through process. When John said, no, no, no. You are, you, I should be baptized of you. He now said, suffer it to be so for now. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. I cannot manifest until I have gone through process. Manifestation is not something that is difficult for me. But for my manifestation to be accurate, I must go through process. The reason the sacrifice of Jesus was accepted was not because he rose from the dead. Even before he died, he was Lord. And he was Lord over death. But the reason his sacrifice was accepted was because it was perfect. That was why even after he rose from the dead, he said, touch me not. I have not ascended to the Father. If you defy my sacrifice, my resurrection will come for nothing. So he knew the power of process. Suffer it to be so for now. Does it become us to fulfill all righteousness? And the creator went down. Remember, he said for now because he was not violating the law of the spirit. So don't come to church tomorrow and say, um, Reverend, suffer it to be so for now. I'm led to impart you. <laughs> I know people. <laughs> the Bible said without every contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. That's the law of the spirit. But this man was going through process. So there was an exception created for him in order for him to become the mirror image that every humanity can look upon. So his life became the compass for us to study and to live accurately. A man without process is a dangerous man. Even though he is engraced by God, he's a risk to his generation. That's why you see most gifted people are most lawless. They think they hear God too. And they think it's about hearing God. For 100 years, Noah was functioning continuously by discernment of spirit. 
for one he built the ark for 100 years and including every nail that was nailed into that ark he saw it in heaven but when the immortals came they didn't judge him by his discerning ability they judge him by his reverence you can be gifted but when jesus shows up he will tell you away from me you walker of iniquity they say we prophesied in your name we casted out devil lord i thought we are saved when we call him lord i thought the proof that we are saved is that we have gifts of the spirit he say away from me you walkers of iniquity men without process so the very gift of god became the reason why they were disqualified every time you pray to god for blessings make sure it does not violate your accuracy and alignment with god the day blessings begin to affect your alignment with god that blessing becomes a cause this is what a lot of people are not taught and then the craze for materiality begins to substitute spirituality you think a man is spiritual because he has three cars you are a joker go to heaven they will surprise you that in a whole generation the most ranking man lived in the wilderness in a whole generation the most ranking man fed on honey and wild locusts. In the whole generation, the most ranking man was wrapped with camel skin. God doesn't judge prosperity by material possession. He judges prosperity by the degree that his word grows on your inside. If his word grows, it will tame your flesh and it will cause things to happen to you. When you look at the wrong things, your value system will be wrong. And you may not have rank inside you. You are mighty on your throne. You reign. You ancient iron king. You know what I'm sharing? What I'm sharing? I want to troubleshoot your mind. Because some of you here are prophets. You wake up someday and it looks as if God wants you to go through a process for five years. And you don't understand, but you are thinking it's a sin. It's not right now. If I'm not, if I don't have a car at the age of 25, it's not good now. And we are men of God. When we come to preach, we will teach the standard of God. But we will not violate your dealing with God. I can't come to teach and say, it is good to be poor. It will enslave a generation. Every time I preach, I will enforce prosperity. But your dealing with God is personal. That's why the root of the tree is not on top. It's under the ground. You don't see it. It's not for public visage. <laughs> you can draw a tree, you will not draw the root. The root is not for men. That one is in the chambers of your intimacy with God. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. Oh my God. We are out of time. They are remaining two. But ah, we can't teach it. We can't. We can't explain it. All the scriptures I wrote here, I'm not even quoting them. It's a body. So you see the way process validated Jesus. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 11 to 17, he gave him public validation. When he knelt down before John and he was baptized, the Bible said the heavens opened. And God spake. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You want God to announce it to your generation? Don't go on Facebook. Don't go on Twitter. Don't go on Instagram. Facebook don't announce men. It is the voice of spirits that announce men. He will thunder from heaven and say, this is my son. At that time, everybody will say there is something about you. You can come for the fellowship. You didn't leave prayer. But everybody is talking in their mind. Mm, if I went for carry that microphone. They say, you have never seen him. But they say, this is my beloved son. Public validation. The second level of validation that God gave him because of process was heaven's empowerment. So as you grow in process, you will see this thing growing. There will be a time when you, you will know that you are an apostle. People will even start calling you an apostle, but there is no authority to back it. That time, your process level has reached a place where God can make people know you are an apostle. If you jump out that time and say, I am an apostle to the nation, you will set yourself up. After that was done, Jesus still followed. In Matthew 4 verse 1, the Bible said, the Holy Ghost led him to the wilderness to be tempted. There's another layer of process. And after he was tempted in the wilderness, and he satisfied the claims of divine justice at that level, the Bible said in Matthew 4 16, that he returned in the power of the Spirit, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun, 
the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. They that sat in the shackles of death, they say a great light is strong for. If Jesus moved from Jordan to the synagogue, he would not have been the light. Because at that level of process, the world just knew him as the son of God. There is another level of process that brought heaven's empowerment. Most of us don't reach there. Because we came for the fellowship, everybody, you gave two words of knowledge. They now say, prophet, prophet, you now come up. The next, when they are talking, they are giving the mic, you just wait. The last time I went to modern market. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. This man is tempting me. Wait until you receive what? Heaven's empowerment is another level of validation. A lot of people don't travel that far. And then thirdly, it is the confirmment of authority for creation and nature to bow to you. Jesus was for 30 years in Nazareth. He never healed one sick person. He was announced the son of God. He never left to heal anybody. He went until he received heaven's empowerment. He came. He began to open blind eyes. In fact, at that point, he had the right to come and read his manifesto. He said, the spirit of God is upon me. For he has anointed me. Hey! If you doubt in that time, bring the blind man. The eye will open. If you doubt him, bring the lame. He will stand up. You may say, come on. Are you not Jesus the carpenter? A carpenter has become the light of the world. Process have redefined his morphology. You know, it's like metamorphosis. You may see a carpenter before he went to the mountain. When he came down, he's no longer a carpenter. He's a light. But it takes prophet, prophetic people to know. But after that time, the Bible went further. He was still living a life of government and prayer. Until in Matthew chapter 17 from verse 1, the Bible said after eight days, he took Peter, James, and John to the mountain. There he prayed. And the fashion of his countenance was altered. Then what happened was that the law and the prophets came to submit their testament to him. Because at that time, kingdom is about to hit the earth. All this while he was light. Now he's about to become an envoy of heaven. At that time, if Jesus moved, he's no longer a man, he's an embassy. So when he was walking on earth, he said, the son of man, which is in heaven. This time, it's no longer the law and prophets that were operating on earth, it's kingdom. And at that level, God said, this is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. But God didn't stop this time. He said, hear ye him. What happened the first time in the Jordan River? Why didn't God say, hear ye him? Process was not complete. It's not because God was running short of vocabulary. It is process that determines the degree to which God will speak to you. If you have not completely obeyed the instruction of yesterday, forget about the instruction of tomorrow. When you complete one level of obedience, then God speaks again. So here, here, him was now added. At that time, if Jesus speak, even the forces of nature will obey. He can command anything at his way. Process. He validates the ordination. The third thing is manifestation. When your process is completed, you become a theater through which we can see the dimensions of heaven. Remember. Uh, Isaiah was the most profound messianic prophet but he could not manifest that dimension. On earth he was a prophet but something happened in Isaiah chapter 6. He went to heaven. said in the year that King Uzziah died I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord and he said his train filled the temple. After he saw the glories of God Instantly, Isaiah, that was a national prophet, now reintroduced himself in heaven. Did you notice the change in introduction? On earth, he was prophet. But when he went to heaven, he said, Woe unto me, I am a man of an unclean lips. <laughs> that means everything Isaiah was saying was what? An utterance from a man of an unclean lips. They knew him as a prophet on earth, but in heaven, he was what? A man of an unclean lips. Until one of the seraphims took one of the coals and touched his tongue. When Isaiah returned in verse 9, he said, A virgin shall be with child. A virgin shall be with child. There was no way he could give expression 
to the messianic prophecy because he was a man of unclean lips. When your process is not complete, the weight of your ordination can never manifest. You will see mercy drop here and there. You will call yourself names or a joker. I am a man. When God touched him, his re-blend began to manifest. A virgin shall be with child and his name shall be called Emmanuel. He shall be called Mighty One, Counselor. He said the government of this world shall be upon his shoulder. From day one, he was the messianic prophet. But he didn't have all chance of manifestation. It's when your process is complete that you can handle glory. The Bible said, when the Lord shall build up Zion, then he shall appear in his glory. Most times what we see are mercy drops to give us assurance that we are called. God told me he will open doors for me to travel around so that I will master the use of my tools. It's not because I have become a, a full-blown apostle. Process. Many never complete process. So what they have is called false manifestation. And that's what destroys a lot of young men. False manifestation. The guy gave his heart to Christ on campus. Now he's 400 level. He said God has called him to go and pastor a church. How many years have you been trained? Jesus was educating the doctors of the law at the age of 12. He became a prophet to the nation at the age of 30. That means Jesus went through process for 18 years. And that is for the weight of his calling. Somebody came to Christ in two years. He said, he's, he's, he's going. Maybe your calling is for one and a half month. <laughs> so it's possible you can. <laughs> if it is the nations, then you can't move until your training is complete. Even when they are pushing you out, you will wait. Because you know that when you saw that vision, you saw the globe. You can't afford to make error on the scene. It will be king size error. So it's better you make error in your father's house. That place you can be covered. A guy says, it's pastor. Meanwhile, this is the same guy that touched the lady and the pastor did counseling with them for six months and gathered them together. After one year, he now says he's been called. Meanwhile, that lost has not even been tamed. Where you will make that error, it will be king size error, and you will never fulfill the mandate of your destiny anymore. Manifestation. A function of completed process. A man without process will have no manifestation that heaven can validate. You may go to heaven and you will be a man of unclean lips. Jesus can appear to you and tell you, I've made you an apostle. It's not a lie, you, but your process must be completed. He said, when your obedience is complete, you can avenge other disobedience. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, he said, for them, for them, oh my God, these are one of my, my most, these, they are scriptures you love. You know, as Jeremiah said, I found a word, I did eat them, and it became the joy and the rejoicing of our heart. He said, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, so he also himself became a partaker of the same that through death he may destroy him that have the power over death even the devil he said that he may deliver them who through fear of death was all their lifetime subject to bondage so jesus paid that price but when you give your heart to christ how much of it are you manifesting that means without process you can't enter into the fullness of ordination the price has been paid but to walk it you must carry your cross and finally, it's what we call reckoning. The first one is born in eternity past. The second two are born on earth. The last one is born in eternity future. That's why outside of Christ there's no security. Your vision came from eternity past. Process and manifestation is in time, but reckoning is in eternity future. So after you do everything you do in time, your report card is not on earth. Your report card is in heaven. That's why Paul said, walk out your salvation with what? With fear and trembling. I have no, you, you don't have the right to be proud about what you are doing. Because you can finish doing it and there is no score in Zion. So every time you do it, you do it at the mercy of grace. Many people don't have understanding of reckoning. So they think it's about what happens on the altar. They walk like this. God is good. I have raised uh, 1,000 children. And yesterday, uh, this shoe I'm wearing is 50,000. That's what the apostle told them. The glory. Glory. 
He thinks is the uh, honorarium he received that is his value. You can receive honorarium for a lifetime, but there's no score for you in heaven. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 28, he said, Having received a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us serve God with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Having received a kingdom that cannot, that means the standard of God stands sure. It doesn't shake or bend for any man. This is why we do what we do with fear. And we call, it would have cost me nothing to come here and preach and wow you and go away. But I pray to you this morning. Because it's not about oratorial power. It's not even about the manifestation in the hall. It's about alignment with Zion. It was around 6.15 in the morning that this message came to me. And I quickly began to write. I began to write. He looked at me, he laughed. Because he knows that some of my messages on the altar, I receive it. So when we come and we sing one song, we are singing another song. It's not because that day the anointing for worship is on us. No. We are, we are asking for mercy. <laughs> you see, man of God, singing and lifting holy hands. That guy is asking for mercy. He doesn't, he doesn't have what to tell you. Because we are not theologians. We are witnesses. There's nothing wrong in being a theologian, but we're sent to bring Jesus to the scene so that as many as see him shall become like him. Because he said, when we shall see him, we shall be like him. Reckoning. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. The Bible says, judge nothing before it's time until God makes manifest the counsel of the heart. Then he shall give to every man he say, I the Lord, Jeremiah 17 verse 11, I try the reins to give unto every man as his way should be. Don't stop your journey at the level of vision. You will be a proud man and you will waste. Don't stop your journey at the level of process. You will be accurate with heaven but you cannot bless humanity. Don't stop your journey at the level of manifestation. You may bless humanity but you have no place in Zion. Stop your journey at the level of reckoning. So that when the white throne appears, when you go there, you will not receive judgment, but you will receive inheritance. For you, the white throne will become a mercy seat. Where you come boldly to receive your inheritance in God. Every one of us was fabricated by the boisterous intelligence of God in order to fulfill an eternal mandate that is consistent with building the new Jerusalem that should appear at the end of all things. What is your part? To what degree are you preparing yourself to fulfill it? And to what extent will you fulfill it when you bow your head and you are ferried through the portals of the great divide into the regions of light? What will be your testimony in heaven? It was in Hebrews chapter 11 that we saw that the stories of men are not told on earth. That was when we knew that what we call biography is a joke. Even autobiography is a joke. The destinies of men are read out. Their citations are read out on the eternal corridors of Zion. That's when you will be shocked that everything you do, God may not count it. It's only one thing God was looking at in your life. I told you about, about Noah that was built in by discernment of spirit. But when they were reading his citation in heaven, they said, Noah feared God. Noah feared God alone was enough for him to be true and true. When they came to Abraham, they say, Abel gave a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. He said, by it, even after he was dead, his blood was speaking from the ground. So the language that heaven recognized concerning Abel in heaven was not his good looks. It was not even his service. It was the sacrifice that Abel gave that resonated in Zion. He came to Abraham and he calculated all his life in one sentence, a man of faith. He said he was looking for a city with foundation whose maker and builder is God. I thought the Bible said Abraham was rich and, and stricken in age and the God, God had blessed him in all things. That one is citation among men. Citation in the angelic realm. Silver and gold is not counted. It's obedience that they saw concerning Abraham. When they came to Moses, a prophet that could decree and the ground opened his mouth and swallowed men of disobedience in heaven. The same when Moses was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the pledges that was in Egypt for a season. He said, For he saw him that was invincible. 
He had no regard for pleasure, but for the recompense of the reward. So because Moses lived his life for reward in heaven, he was marked righteous. What is the story that will be told concerning you in the day of reckoning? This is why we live in time as strange creatures. Because we say your life is a story that God is telling from heaven. What will be said concerning you when you appear in Zion? Bow your heads and pray. We are out of time. Usually this is the time where I begin to fly. But we don't have the time. I know this is church. This is not revival meeting. This is not camp meeting. So we are constrained. Talk to Jesus. You may not have had a vision. You may not have been submitted to process. Your process may not have been completed while you are praying for manifestation. And you may even be manifesting now, but you have lost days of Zion. So you don't know there's a day of reckoning. The Bible said, I saw a white throne appear, and books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. Another book was open. Books of service, book of life, they were open. So that God can give to every man as his ways should be. Beauty will count for nothing. There's a place where it is the eternities of God. When the ends of eternity are open, what will they matter? Say about your life. That's the quality of life that you live. It doesn't matter anymore. On earth you can be an apostle. But in heaven, Jesus said, They that overcome, I will plant them in the courts of my father as a tree of life. I will give them a white stone that no man know it. And upon that white stone, but in heaven, you may be an overcomer. What is the story that will be told concerning you? When the borderlines of the of the eternities are open, are the things that are rooted in the origins of Zion. This is where the relevance of men are drawn from. I am you. I am for the next five minutes there is something I will do this morning I want to place a demand on the apostolic office so that Zion will open for someone this morning and for the first time you will draw your reference from eternity there is a place where God uses men to teach men but there is a place when the Holy Ghost himself becomes your teacher I want to make a demand on heaven we will pray in tongues for five minutes. I don't have time now to flow so long. But when we are done praying, I will make certain things happen by the apostolic authority. And hear me, I say this with all humility in God. These are the bodies the Lord has put in my heart this morning. So that somebody will begin to serve with a different orientation. We will pray in tongues for five minutes. Go ahead and ask the Lord. To bring you an encounter that will change your story. We lift your name on high. Arazila vrende dera kadila sundra kadaga babondas. Rapate kebundo sabradili gizundra paragatas. Rafatundra paru sundra kila paragada bondas. Rakababa babori ala mahanda. You see, on the last day of the feast, he rose up with a cry. He rose up with a cry. They that test, he said, they should come and drink of him. Mamora sapate ke porono salibahata vele bunda sabra kidora amantala kibo sabra handa lagabara rete de mumala kida suna the day of doing business in deep waters take me deeper deeper in love with you
make that your heart cry tonight. Deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper, deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. Father, we thank you. Father, tonight we ask that you take us through the veil that we may behold an interface reality. We ask that tonight you will bet something substantive in our spirit. You will ferry us beyond the forces of religion, the cliches of the church. You will carry us to interact with reality. Father, tonight let everyone have a tangible encounter with your spirit. That which is beyond everything that can be explained on cerebral articulation. That which is beyond everything that we can explain cognitively. That which is eternal in nature and in scope. A substance of reality be furnished on our inside. The forces of life that bet conviction in the heart of men beyond that which they can ever imagine. That which you do to the heart of mighty patriarchs of old. That furnished convictions enough to make them even die gladly. Because they understood that they were part of a cause that transcended time. We ask that you bring us into those depths with you tonight. We are meaning and essence will be furnished bless us with your presence bless us with your power let there be invigorations strengthenings empowerments by your spirit that will cause a reverberation beyond the tides of this nation that which enthrones men and give them authority over territories to uninstall demonic installation and to establish new ordinances, to enact and to legislate policies that come from the throne of Zion, that which causes men to lift up their hands and never get weary, that which grants men wisdom and access into realms where they speak for the counsel of the Lord. We ask that that which make men to become light in darkness, the same will be furnished in our lives even tomorrow. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. Thine is the kingdom, for thine is the power, for thine is the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. God bless you so good. The Lord bless you richly. Tonight is a night of power. But I would need to establish the coordinates before we journey into deep spheres many of you will be empowered tonight <laughs> I'm not saying I will educate and motivate you something tangible will come upon you and you will know that you have been changed into another man <laughs> I love I love spiritual realities it's such a shame when we reduce spirituality to religion and set of rules. An ordinary man called Saul was looking for his father's missing asses. And he came before a man and he looked upon him. <laughs> there was no church service. There was no ceremony. He looked upon him. He said, the missing asses have already been found. But that's not the reason you are here. He said, today the spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And you will be changed into another man. <laughs> Just to convince you. He said, as you depart from me. You will stretch through the garrison of the Philistine. And you will meet two men. 
they will give you bread. He said, as you jolly past them, you will see a company of prophets. He said, there the Spirit of God will come upon you and you will be changed into another man. How do men secure so much authority with God? By what technology do people come to a place where they have so much stature in the spirit? And they can just wake up from their bedside and they make a proclamation and it has an impact over a generation. Elisha was lying down, the, his little boy Gehazi, ran out and he saw chariots. A mighty army had besieged them and he came to him, said, we've been besieged. And he said, do not bother, we have more on our side. How do men become so mighty in God? I don't know about you, but that's where I'm joining into. <laughs> oh my God. You come to church, you think it's about falling on the floor and encouraging the man of God. These are not the things we read. And he told the Lord, please open his eyes, let him see. And suddenly the guy's eye was open and he saw upon the mountain chariots of fire. There was no church service. Men that understood the technology of moving the hand of God. In their bed chamber, they can travel to places. Even when Gehazi messed up, he said, did my spirit not go with you? How do men become so mighty with God? Jacob was just talking with his son Joseph. Ah! He said, thanks be to God. He began to give a narrative of his encounters with God. And he said, see today. The Lord has not just blessed me. I have seen my sons and their sons. And Joseph said, I came with my children. He said, really? Where are they? Bring them forward. And suddenly the man casted his hand upon them. And he said, may the name of Israel be named upon them. Immediately in the archives of heaven, these two guys were numbered into the 12 tribes of Israel. There was no service. These are men who rise up and say, gather around your father Israel that I may bless you. And he will bless them. And the Bible said when he was done blessing them, he gathered himself onto his bed and he slept with his fathers. They knew the time of death. They knew when the day of departure came. They did not die. They slept. He said, and David, after he has served his generation, according to the will of the Lord, he slept with his fathers. How do men journey so deep in God that they come to a point where it's as if they are masters over the elements of creation? is by the spirit of the living God and you think everything we have come to do is to join a church service and carry out activities and go back home it's a lie from the pit of hell in 1st Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11 he said the things that happened to the men of old he said it happened as an example unto us whom the end of the age is come in Romans chapter 15 verse 4 he said the things that were written aforetime he said they were written for our learning so that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Paul looked upon the things that happened. He studied the life of the patriarchs. He asked the question, he said, what did Abraham, our father, according to the flesh, found? He knew that spirituality begins when you join into the potters where men are forged in God. And he had the boldness to declare. He said, according as it is written, they believe and have spoken. He said, we also, having the same spirit of faith, we believe and therefore we speak. We have something that is substantial in God. It's not a tradition. It's not a religion. It's not a set of activities. It is a force of life playing out through the lives of men. It is divinity finding expression through the corridors of a human vessel. So that through you, the hand of God can be stretched over a territory. A young man that had no understanding, the Bible said he led the ships and he journeyed to the back sides of the desert and he came even to Horeb, the mountain of God, and he had an encounter with God. He left that place not as a human being, he left there as a God. God said to him, I have made you a God unto Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother have become thy prophet. I don't know what you are pursuing in God. I journey after encounters. I strive that I may align with him who is the king in the spirit so that on earth I can mirror his dimensions. The journey of the faith is not a journey in the flesh. It's a journey into the deep waters in the realm of the spirit until you see him as he is so that you can make an appearance and be a representative of his reality in the natural. 
How do you intend to colonize a world? A world that has been cracked and a world that is governed by all kinds of princes in darkness. The very territory that you are walking upon, there are princes that are governing all the operations around different sphere of that territory. How do you expect to prevail in a land like that? Except as you can see the realities in the spirit and you are empowered and invigorated by the forces that gather the constellations together. We have been deceived. Can you ask the Lord tonight to grant you an encounter? <laughs> you see, scepters and mantles will fall tonight. <laughs> Feeble men shall be translated into mighty veterans. <laughs> oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. He said 400 broken men, battered men, men who are in debt, men without future, men without vision. They met David in the cave of Atulam. He was not in the palace, he was in the cave, cut out from civilization. 400 broken men met him. And when he was torn with them, they became mighty. When David was about to build the temple of the Lord, they brought goose, goats, sheep. They brought mighty things, silver, bronze, all kinds of iron. Men that were broken, battered. They met him in a cave. They didn't meet him in a palace. The worth of everything they brought to David in our day today is worth $22 billion. By what means can the destiny of a man be turned around? By what technology? What do these men found with God? What did they find? We journey the spirit looking for realities so that our day and our time the glory of the Lord will be seen. It's a journey of life. You don't have to look it to be it. It works within the context of the economy of grace. And everyone that align his heart, the Lord will stretch forth his hands. You didn't choose yourself. You were numbered in him before the foundations of the world. Deeper in love with you. Jesus holds me close in your embrace. Take me deeper. Deeper than I ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. I want to love to be deeper in love. You see, the things that happen in our world today, you may call it a civilization, you may call it an era, but in the spirit realm, they are entities. When you see young ladies begin to wear exposing wears, it is not a manifestation of an era. A spirit have just shown up in eternity. What you call seasons and times, they are not calculated in eternity as time. They are calculated as seasons. They are calculated as entities enthroned over territories. What you call a civilization is actually a manifestation of a spirit. The same way, when we turn it back to eternity, the days that we live in, they will be wielded and seeded to men. The day you are living in today, you call it a time. But in eternity, it is built to a man. The whole of our reality and our civilization will be named after a man. Because of how deep he journeyed with God. He said, in the days of John the Baptist, everything that happened in that era was calculated as a person. It was called John the Baptist. Reality is judged differently. We are the one messing up our lives in time. We are the ones messing up our lives. There is a place in God where you need to stand so that you can find relevance in time. Because the purposes of God that are journeying through time, they are weaved into the lives of men. Every time you align with the Spirit of God, you bring your own quota so that a building, an edifice that houses the policies of heaven will begin to find expression. You cannot afford to sleep in a day like this. You cannot afford to relax. Man of God said, the Bible says, woe unto him that is at ease in Zion. It is possible to be at ease in Zion. 
<laughs> Deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper, deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I love to be deeper in love. Take me deeper. Deeper in love with you, Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper, deeper than I've ever been before. I just wanna love you more and more. How I love. See, a lot of you made decisions last night and the day before. A season is about to break loose upon you. A new order of government is about to streamline you into a place where God can begin to steward his life into you so that you can become a steward of the mysteries of God. A season is about to break upon you where different kinds of instructions will be passed. Different kinds of requirements, expectations will be placed upon you. The goal of it is not to mar your life. It is so that a kingdom, a dimension, a face, a part of the kingdom can break out through your life. I encourage you as you leave the meeting, stay aligned. Something bigger than everything you have imagined is about to break upon you. God doesn't break men. He's a maker of men. He called men that were ordinary fishermen. He said, follow me. What do you think their lives would have translated to? Even in their world, they were peasants. They were the least of men. Nobody reckoned with them. They said, follow me, follow me. Everything Jesus does has a significance that is eternal in scope. If he went to the elite of the society, you say it's because of their much schooling. If he went to the mighty, you say it's because of their influence. You know, in the church today, we look for the big men, the mighty men. We call them helpers. Jesus went to the little, the insignificant in the society because it is by the power of the kingdom that men are made. Even the substances that are committed to your hand, they are sacred things given to you so that you can steal the dimension of God. If you will make up your mind to follow him, something will change. There will be a shift. You will not be able to imagine it. A day has come where sons of order must arise. Men that know nothing but the work, the power, and the reality of the spirit of the living God. It's a solemn assembly where men are summoned into light. Where men are summoned into mysteries. So that strange possibilities that at all time was not imagined concerning them will begin to break out of their lives. The men that take the territory, they are men that are separated from their civilization. Because a civilization that trains you robs you of the power to alter it. If you want to change the world, God has to separate you from that world. You have to be exposed to a new school, a new syllabus of training, so that you can come and correct the errors of your civilization. That is why God is going to be separating you. That's what God is going to lead you, be leading you through very tight, narrow corners of alignment. Because he wants to separate all the forces of the civilization in your life and bring you to a plane where you can speak and command deliverances unto Jacob. Once again, ask the Lord, to speak to you tonight. Hear things that your ears will not capture, but your heart will perceive. Ask him to talk to you. You can preach a message for two hours, but only a line will be an instruction to somebody. So it's not about how robust, how posterous, how intelligent the message is. It is what the person can catch that makes a difference. And you ask the Lord that you will catch that word that is for you. When the word of the Lord appears to you, a lot of things change. He said, and the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. The Lord appeared to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. A prophet was born. The day the word of the Lord appeared to him. Everything you call an advantage is a flesh, is a waste. True advantage is in the spirit. 
until your reality is made known to you until there is a supply of the spirit you are incapacitated even before you began because the entities that you contend with they are enthroned in the spirit they come by power they come by authority and you must you must be supplied sufficiently with enough power enough authority enough mystery enough secret enough wisdom enough insight before you can uninstall everything that they do in your territory some of us our destiny is in the political corridor our destiny is in the business world our destiny is, is in the body of christ but it will never be realized except as we allow the spirit to begin a ministration in our lives ask the lord to minister to you tonight I'm not going to be teaching so to say I just want to point out a few things to you and then we'll begin to pray are we together we have done we have laid some blocks in the previous days it's time to consciously press into things are we together I just want to show you a few things you know we began by thank you we began by establishing the fact that nothing can be bettered in the natural except as it is first of all apprehended in the spirit our work with jesus the purposes the lord has committed to us the establishment of these purposes on the face of the earth we establish that it is impossible to bet any of these dimensions or any of these realities in the natural except as it is first of all apprehended in the spirit and so we said the orientation of our growth in god is not in the natural it is in the spirit what we see in the natural is just a byproduct of the things that are happening in the spirit are we together in fact we established that the very revelation upon which the church was built was caught in the spirit and jesus said this same technology by which you have caught this revelation is the same strategy by which everything I intend to do on the face of the earth will be carried out. You will first of all apprehend it in the spirit, then you will have the authority to establish it on the earth. I told us that when God was addressing Job, he told him, he made a very simple statement that have so much weight as far as humanity will be relevant in his operation with God he said in Job chapter 38 verse 4 he said declare now if you have understanding it was not a direct question the Lord was asking the Lord was actually telling him you only have the authority to declare when you have secured understanding of the matter and in chapter 33 of that scripture the Bible made us to understand 
that understanding is first of all caught and apprehended in the spirit because anything that you are permitted to establish on the earth must first of all be captured on the blueprint of creation so what you are actually declaring is not something you are betting by an act of your wisdom or your authority what you are actually declaring and bringing forth are things that the Lord have already established within the context of the counsel of his will before the foundations of the earth. Because the Lord told him, he said, do you know the ordinances of heaven? Or by what means they are established, their dominions are established upon the earth. The only basis by which you can have authority to establish the ordinances of heaven as dominion upon the earth is when you have secured understanding in the spirit. Are we together? So we went further to say, before understanding can be captured in its full scale, we must first of all interact with the three entities in the Godhead. Because the three entities in the Godhead have, have different strategy of educating and implementing policies on the earth. We said the Father brings you light. He quickens you into portals of knowledge so that you can know things that are in the spirit. And you saw that when Peter gave that answer to Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus answered him in verse 17 of that scripture. He said, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. He said, but my father which is in heaven. So the revelation that came to Peter was a part that the father plays in betting the dominions of heaven on the earth. He brings you into regions of understanding. He brings you insight understanding into things that hold and have their roots in the spirit however i made us understand yesterday that if you only operate at a sphere where you can pick things from the realm of god you will not have the requisite authority on the face of the earth to implement it because the same peter that had access into knowledge by the wisdom of the father the same peter in a moment drew jesus backward and began to fight the very thing that jesus was to implement and jesus said get deep behind me satan and he didn't stop there in fact, as far as the scales of balances were concerned, Peter was as light as chaff. Because it was much later Jesus told him, Ah, Simon, Simon. He says, Satan desires to have you, to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed that your faith faileth not. So if you operate at a level where you can only pick things, you have understanding of things in the spirit, permit me to let you know you don't have authority in the natural. And if you are not even careful, the things you break into in the spirit may implicate you. Because most people go about saying things that they have seen and it becomes the reason why their life is captured in all kinds of frustrations. Because they think it's all about seeing things in the spirit. It is not enough to interface with the father to capture revelation. That is one face, that is one layer in the operations of God. And I told us after we are beginning to receive things from the realm of God, then the impute, the impute of the son comes in. The son gives us education. He brings us wisdom. He brings us strategies on how to implement the things that we have seen in the spirit. So he said, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. This thing the father has revealed to you, in order to bring you into full understanding and adequate strategy in bringing it to forth, I need to educate you. That this thing the Father has revealed to you is the only basis by which the church can be built on the earth. And if the church is built based on this strategy, then darkness will not have authority over it. But that you have understanding and you know the strategy does not still give you the authority and the empowerment to bring to pass. Because most of us here, we don't need to go too far. Most of you here, you have heard what God wants you to be. Some of you have been, the Lord has started showing you visions from when you were a child. How that you'll be a prophet. Some of you, God has revealed to you how that you will be a revivalist. But up until today, you have not begun. That is because you know and you have the strategy. But the authority, the empowerment, the internal invigoration to bring forth the things that you have seen have not yet been imparted. And I said, in order to bring forth, we must come to a point where we begin to interact with the Holy Ghost. Because the Father may bring you revelation grant you insight and understanding the son may give you interpretation wisdom and strategy but it does not mean you have become the kind of education that the holy ghost grants us is different from that of the father and the son in the educational system of the holy spirit 
he does not just reveal to you he does not just educate you as to the strategy of their implementation the holy spirit literally carries you into the realm of that knowledge so you don't just know you become that which you have known i cited an example i told you it's one thing for a doctor to tell you if you have sore throat sore throat bitter mouth weakness nausea you have malaria you have that knowledge in your head but if the holy ghost wants to teach you he won't tell you the symptoms of malaria he will impart malaria into you so you have first-hand experience of malaria then you have the capacity to show anybody what malaria is because the moment they look upon you they will see malaria so until you have come to a point where you are captured in the syllabus of the teachings of the holy spirit you are not sufficiently equipped to be a witness and as such you don't have the authority to bet the things that were predicated in the spirit and captured in the context of your ordination to bring forth in time that is why in our interactions and in our dealing the holy ghost becomes the most significant partner and entity that we have business with in time because until you come into the regions of experience you don't have the authority to bring forth in time the holy ghost carries you into realms of reality he gives you first-hand knowledge of the things that you are seeing so that you can become a witness of those things in time the thing is when the holy ghost is done with you his desire is that you will become the jesus of your world because the strategy of heaven is to ensure that jesus is not just trapped in one vessel the purpose of heaven is not that jesus should be captured in one man the purpose of heaven is that that which jesus is and stands for many will become it so that they can become manifestors of that life that is why the bible said the glory of god shall cover the earth as the waters surround the ocean the glory of god is not the cloud the cloud is the manifestation of the glory the word glory is the word doxa in greek is the word kaboid in hebrew it means the full expression of a thing in fact in ancient hebrew what they used to illustrate glory is a statue when you mount a statue outside under the rain is the same under the sun is the same so it becomes the full expression of a reality regardless of circumstantial interferences so the purpose of the holy spirit is for you and i to become the jesus of our world so that everything the lord wants to implement when he stretches his hand he can stretch it through us so the apostles pray he says stretch forth thy hands that signs and wonders may be performed by the name of thy holy child the hands that were stretched were the hands of peter james and john but these ones have become weaved through the gateways of alignment until every time they acted it was jesus acting in fact when they gave instruction to the gentile church they said it pleased the holy ghost and us that we should not burden the church with circumcision it pleased the holy ghost and us they have come to a point where the desires of the holy spirit is their desires the burdens of the holy spirit is their body it is within the context of that kind of experience that they have the status in the spirit to be called apostles because an apostle is not a title an apostle is one that bears the weight the burden and the heartbeat of the king everywhere an apostle shows up the burdens of the kingdom he represented is manifested the apostolic is the first form of strategy that the kingdom was put in place and recognized as the ecclesia because the ecclesia is an envoy sent from heaven to be a full scope representative of everything that the kingdom of god is but you have to come to a point where you have paid the burden the price and the sacrifice of alignment to become one with that which you represent that is when witness is accurate but we have a lot of Christians today who are talking about things that are hollow. Things that are sacred because they heard other preachers say it. People come and talk about angelic beings. <laughs> when the servant of God Jude was writing, he said these ones, they speak about high matters that they don't have understanding of. He said even Michael, the archangel, when he came to Satan, he didn't use reviling words. He only said the Lord rebuke you young people who don't have understanding of sacred matters talking 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 and then their lives are frustrated plagued with all kinds of darkness because they don't know the things that they are interacting with 
you must first of all follow by alignment and i established yesterday that as we journey in alignment the holy ghost does not only bring us into realms of knowledge the holy ghost actually shuts the gates of corruption in our lives the corruption that comes by the lust of the eyes the corruption that comes by the lust of the flesh the corruption that comes by the pride of life the holy ghost shuts down all of these things then we become accurate representatives of the kingdom of god that's the first purpose of alignment and for a generation to arise a daniel generation to arise it was be a generation that is willing to pay the price of alignment the first thing the bible revealed concerning daniel was the fact that him and his friends decided not to defy themselves with the king's meat <laughs> he said they decided not to defy themselves they paid the price of alignment they were living on water and vegetable for 10 days and the first thing they proved to the eunuch is that what makes fresh is not what you eat what makes fresh is who you are standing with what you are interacting with what you are interfacing with because when the eunuch came to examine them they were 10 times better than the people that were eating the king's meat is it that they had crisis with meat no the food that the king eat is first of all consecrated to idols they decided to separate themselves from the civilization of their time you see most of us come we say we want to be part of the army the lord is raising but the first gaze on us is a revelation of everything that is captured within the context of the ideology of the world system from the very way we talk from the very things we do the thoughts that traffic our minds everything about our life is an educational system that comes from the world system and then we come we say we want to change the world which world do you want to change you're already an ambassador of the world <laughs> you can't change a, a system you're already an agent of and then we say all kinds of things you are directly under the influence of a demon and then you are coming speaking against the demon it's just like betraying your master the first thing the demon will do is to lead you to a place where he will afflict your body <laughs> and then he will frustrate your circumstances because he's already a god over your mind he will lead you away from your destiny when he is sure that he has taken you far then he will begin to deal with you and then the demon will know that you have tendencies of rebellion rebellion in this context is a possibility that one day you will align with jesus and fight him he knows you have tendencies of rebellion so he will separate you from the folk lead you to a place of irrecoverable loss then he will dump you there he will not fulfill your purpose and you know it will be relevant to it again because he now know that God, this man has tendencies of rebellion but a daniel generation is a generation that have proposed in their heart that they will not defy themselves even when the most common thing to do is to bow to the world system they will choose to stand even if they are alone these guys were so obstinate about their decision that a day came where they were cast into the lake of fire and they said oh king live forever he said we will not be careful to answer you in this matter if it's about this matter we don't need to follow the decorum we don't need to follow the protocol of addressing matters within the context of your kingdom he said in this matter we are not careful we will not bow we will not bow hear it oh king we will not bow and he said let the fire be made hotter than it was seven times and when they were entering the fire they were giving praise if we perish we perish even if god will not rise to deliver us we trust him because we have come to realize that the value of life is not in time everything we are living for is an investment into eternity it's in eternity that life is lived everything we have here is like air time it's an opportunity a privilege given to us to invest into eternity it is in eternity that we will see our reality ah when you see men like paul in eternity 
Then you, what you think he was in time is a, a rabbi that carried parchments and books teaching. When you see him in eternity, you will see the brightest form of light. He will be clothed with stars. And then you will marvel. You know, when John met Jesus, as he was ferried in the Isle of Patmos into the realm of the Spirit, John was the closest disciple to Jesus. The Bible said he would lean on his chest. And he was the one that asked very daring questions that even Peter, who was bold, could not ask. But when he saw him in eternity, the one he was leaning on was not the one he saw. He saw a spear come out of his mouth. His leg was like polished bronze. His face shined like the sun. He was giddy. Who is this? The description that was given to him was not Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. He was called the one that lived forevermore. He was called the Alpha, the Omega. He was dead, but now he lives forevermore. The status have changed. Everything you are doing here is sending forth investment into eternity. Because it's in eternity we will see him. And we will. Is this who you are? You will see Patrick and his name will no longer be Patrick. Because when we come into eternity, he said, he will give every one of us a name that no man knoweth. That name is a function of the kind of service that you rendered in time. That was the thing people like Paul knew and they say, Paul and Barnabas, they say, this be the man that has started their lives for Jesus. They were doing things that they were not instructed to do. If it means time for Jesus, it was a gate of, of opportunity for them. Alignment. So Daniel and his friends proposed in their heart that they will not defy themselves with the king's meat. How many times and how many places have you compromised? And then sometimes you do it in a hidden form. If you know how many clouds of witnesses are watching you, that time you locked yourself behind closed doors. <laughs> that thing you are doing, hiding from the pastor and a few brethren. The whole number on earth is not up to one third of what is in heaven. The Bible said, oh my God. It said 100,000 times 100,000, 10,000 times 10,000 angels, they stood before him in worship. And the Bible said one third of the angels fell from heaven. And that number, if we use multiplicative arithmetic, is more than a hundred trillion. So the number of demons on earth, the least you can find is 500 million. How many are we on earth? And then the Bible says we are encompassed by a cloud of witnesses. And then you go, you lock yourself, and then you hide behind closed door, and you say you are hiding. secret purity they propose in their heart they say we will not defy ourselves you see the first thing is not the matching order because if you give the matching order to babes they will be in trouble you say the trumpet makes an unusual sound who will prepare for battle they may not even be able to discern because you see God is not looking for number he doesn't win by number. He wins by authority. So he's looking for genuine persons who can stand with him. That's the story of Gideon. It's not by the multitude. So we don't just come and say, this is what God wants to do. Let's go there. I'm showing you what the requirements for being numbered in the armies of Zion. And if the Lord revealed this to you, you will be shocked how narrow your life will become. I used to be a football fan. In fact, they called me Skywide. You know, the guy that analyzes football in ESPN, back then around 2000, 2001, his name was, he's called Tommy Smith. So after he gives his analysis, he said, this is Tommy Smith worldwide. So in the studio where we watched football, because we were filled with records, we were compendiums of records. And now say if Tommy Speed is worldwide, you, you are skywide. So we give records. We give, if a club wants to play, we tell you where the club started. The trophies they have won. They post, we analyze it like the studio. But in the place of prayer, light appeared to me. And I was caught up in a trance. And I saw beings like, they were like crocodiles. They were alighting on top of a mountain and warring against the church warring against the church and as i looked what is happening suddenly a button entered my hand i didn't know from whence it came 
And I joined and began to fight, began to fight. And I saw many persons were already contending with these entities. And somebody called me aside. He said, lead the people to safety. And I was, as I was leading them, they were giving me their substances. As I woke up from that trance, I was plagued. The appetite for football died. My path became narrow. Most of my friends, they will call 10 times, 20 times. I have not returned their call. And even while they are talking, sometimes I end the call. I would think they are done talking. They became offended. My life became narrow. I was being led into a narrow path. The things that delighted me, the appetites began to die. Rules began to show up. I would sleep in the night time and I will roll on the bed on the morning unless I wake up to pray. Sometimes you go to eat and then it's as if if you touch that food in your mouth, it's a sin. These things are not doctrines. They are lexicons of instructions that are weaved into the path of your ordination. And until you subscribe to them, you will never be relevant with God. When the portals of alignment were opened to me, I began to see strange kinds of power. You know, we thought power was all about people being slain. So we come for a meeting from the prayer, from the opening prayer. We stare the waters. People are on the floor everywhere. But God began to show me. He said, these things are tangible realities. I showed up in tent and the woman was crying. You know, tent from the backside. The daughter, something hit her on the chest and she was screaming and she fell down and died. By the time we came, she was already dead for three hours. Her body was cold like stockfish and her hand had become stiff. And we showed up there and we began to pray. And we called her back to life. That was when it dawned on me that power had nothing to do with people being slain. Because Michael Jackson can show up in the stadium and people will be slain. Because when expectation collides suddenly with reality, you are overwhelmed. If you see what you don't expect, all of a sudden, your emotions are, are, are overtaken. And you lose comportment. It's deeper than being slain. They came to Jesus. He said, who sit down? And he said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. They went back and fell. They got up. Who six years said Jesus of Nazareth? He said, I already told you I am he. They went back fell. And when they got up, they arrested him to kill him. You can fall a hundred times. You will still be an agent of darkness. It's a tangible reality. It's a tangible reality. But it begins from Daniel and his friends proposed in their heart that they will not defy themselves with the king's meat. The next thing the Bible reveals about Daniel. <laughs> you know everything Daniel did, if you are not careful, you will tie it to the activities. But the Bible said what was at work in Daniel was an excellent spirit. So for Daniel to refuse to defy himself was because the excellent spirit that was at work in him was giving him instruction and he was obeying. The next thing we saw about Daniel was that he was a man of prayer. The Bible said three times Daniel we pray facing Jerusalem. Because even though he was in captivity, his visions were cast on what the Lord wanted to do for his people. Every time Daniel rose in the morning, afternoon and evening, he was focused on Jerusalem in intercession. If you study Daniel chapter 6 from verse 1 to 4, he said the king had gathered all the wise men and among them he selected three presidents to govern over the realm and Daniel was preferred among all of them. And he said they sought a case against Daniel but they found nothing except in his service to his God. That means Daniel was faultless in all of his ways. Even within the context of natural judgment, you can't find a fault against Daniel. He was an upright man. The only way you could fight Daniel was to bring something that would constitute a hindrance, a hindrance between him and his God. And they went and told the king, let no man make any petition to any other God except you. But Daniel had aligned so much to God. He had fraternized with God so much that he is willing to give up everything, including his life. Because part of the decree was that anybody that prays to any other God will be cast to the den of lions. The decree was already established. So if you go to pray 
know that you are already joining into the pit of lions. They didn't say something will happen. They say you will be cast into the den of lions. But the Bible said Daniel continued in prayers three times a day as his custom was. It became difficult for any other person to pray. Only Daniel was the one praying. His commitment was beyond life. His commitment was beyond everything life had to offer. To others, it may be an activity. Let's gather together and pray. But when the decree came, nobody was praying anymore. Because we saw that when they said they were not going to defy themselves, it was Daniel and his friend. But now a decree has come that if you pray, you will be killed. It was only Daniel that was praying. The Daniel generation is a generation that will not back down for darkness. Even if it means being slain. He stood his ground in the place of prayer. In the place of fasting. In the place of intercession. He knew that Daniel will only be relevant so long as he stayed with God and his purpose. There will be no Daniel in eternity except as he will give birth to the purpose of God that was given to him for his generation. That's why the Bible, the whole exploits of David, it was not recorded that he was a great king. He said after he had served his generation according to the will of the Lord. That is how citations are read in eternity. Citations in eternity are not a function of the flamboyant life you lived. Citations in the annals of eternity are consistent with the quality of service you rendered as it is consistent with your ordination. He said David, after he has served his generation, According to the will of the Lord, he slept with his fathers. Daniel knew there will be no Daniel in eternity, except he bets that which is written concerning him. You know, people don't have this understanding, so we think it's about church. We make up the number. The day we come to church and church is full, the quiet people are motivated. That day they sing the best kinds of song. People celebrate with joy and enthusiasm and we go home. We don't take territories like that. Even if our number increased to a hundred million, our world will still be dark. That's why you can have a Christian in the head of the government, but darkness will still prevail. Because we have calculated value in the form of number. But in eternity, value is consistent with life. You can use all your effort to gather all the Christians in Zaria. And even if all the Christians in Zaria begin to meet in one place, it does not translate to taking over Zaria. Because God doesn't judge by number. Alignment enthrones men in the kingdom. Alignment gives men authority over territories. Alignment in the place of obedience. Alignment in the place of prayer. And he said, Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 verse 2. He said, I, Daniel, understood by books. He studied the writings of Jeremiah the prophet and he understood that what God, do you see the level and the extent to which these people pursue after ordination? This is a guy who decided not to defile himself. This is a guy giving to prayers. He was still seeking prophecies, prophecies. What did God say concerning our people? What did God say concerning the territory? There are lots of people here who say God has given them a, a territory, but they don't know the prophecies concerning that territory. Your preparation is defective. He knew that the year of captivity was 70. So by the authority of prophecy, he began to demand deliverance unto Jacob. What God has told you to do, what has God spoken about it, about it? Some of us say we are prophets. And we don't even know how the prophetic ministry works. We say we are apostles. And they say, please, what are the criteria of an apostle? You don't even know one. And you cannot even give a narrative about one apostle in the scripture even the things God has spoken to you about you have forgotten some you are not qualified for the service Daniel pursued the records he pursued the records this is what Jeremiah said about this captivity it's time for it to end and the moment he found it he stripped himself he dressed himself in sackcloth and began to intercede for 21 days he was in the place of prayer no wonder he was a man of power he was a man of wisdom and strategy. The Bible said, Gabriel, even the man Gabriel, he showed up. And he was given authority to fly swiftly. 
his speed was accelerated so that he could urgently come to Daniel. He said, and I have come to give you skill and to give you understanding. He has come to give him skill and understanding. That was what prepared Daniel into the realms of encounters. He secured authority and dominion by fulfilling the, the requirements of alignment. Obedience, prayer, study of the world, searching out the mysteries, the secrets concerning the assignment the Lord has given. The first question you ask yourself is, are you sure you are part of the Daniel generation? What is the quality of your fraternity with the Holy Spirit? How many instructions has the Holy Ghost given to you that you have kept to and obeyed? What level of defilement have you fallen into? Because if the marching orders is given tonight, there will be a lot of casualties. You see, in the context of God's interaction with us as a father, a lot of things are tolerated. But when we begin to deal with kingdom matters, the God we are interfacing with is a king. So laws, precepts, ordinances, they become paramount. That's why Ananias can fall down and die. That's why the sons of Aaron can go before the throne of grace and they are burnt. Because in kingdom context, laws are paramount. The God that you interact with in the context of a kingdom is not a father, he's a king. And a lot of people have not been instructed. Did you not know that even in the church, the church which is supposed to be the umbrella of grace, Paul said, because a lot do, do not discern the body, many die. Within the umbrella of grace, he said, many die, many are sick, many die because they do not discern the body. That's legislation. When matters of legislation are on board, God is as strict as a lion. Imagine you come to church and you fall sick because you are part of a church. You don't discern the oppression. You think you can go and backbite. You think you can go and snare. You think you can bring corruption into the body. He said because they don't discern the body. He said many see are sick and many sleep. They die. Because these are matters of legislation. There will be no revival. I'm sorry to tell you, there will be no revival and there will be no territorial colonization except as men come back to yield themselves to the Holy Spirit. Because God is not under compulsion to do what he wants to do with your generation. He will do it his way and we must align to his way for it to be done. If we disalign with him, he will wait until our generation pass out. And even if there are no men on the face of the earth, he will raise stones. He's not committed to bring to pass what he wants to do with men. Because he is God, it must happen. That we align with him is a kind of wisdom that gives us relevance with God. You need to pay attention. They have reduced Christianity to an activity. So you have a set of expectations things you want to do, the kinds of feeling you are used to, I, when this feeling is not there, I, and very few people can discern what's happening in the realm. The mighty things that these men did in scriptures, the Bible didn't record, sometimes they did them in the face of death. Imagine Moses carrying over three million people, and he comes to a Red Sea, and three million people are hauling insults at him. And then at that point, Moses can secure verdict from heaven. You think he's the kind of preacher that me and you are? Imagine you come to church now, everybody say, What's he talking? I beg, forget these people. Hi, what? I beg, go, 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 go. Can you move power when that kind of thing is happening? Because we have reduced everything to emotion. Before you move in power, you have to bring the people to a kind of mindset. We said the atmosphere is choked. <laughs> The atmosphere is choked. It's choked. These men were not like that. They interacted with the, the Lord, the Lord himself. And it doesn't matter what you think. Three million people hauling insult at somebody. 
and they say be still you will see the salvation of the lord it's not the people that make it happen it's the god of zion if one man can align heaven will move smith wigglesworth said if one man is obedient god is willing to jump over a million persons jesus will come to raise the dead and even the very persons that is coming to render service to say oh, no no we know he will rise on the resurrection we know what then you say unbelief he said oh we believe we believe but he will rise on the last day <laughs> and he stood in front of everybody he said lazarus comfort you have assurance beyond things to do that kind of feat but the only way you can come to that level of assurance is when your life is poured as a sacrifice. Your life is poured as a sacrifice. Their senses are active. When they say they see the spirit, they are not imagining. They are seeing. The first time I saw a vision, I was, at, I was seven. I was worshipping with my mom in, my, in our native dialect. It's a usual tradition. She comes out, lie down, we sing from 8 to 10 p.m. until I'll sleep off and leave her. They'll come and carry me inside. And we we're just singing, 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 singing. And suddenly, we laid on two benches outside. She loved singing. In fact, she was a choir mistress. Those days in the Orthodox Catholic Church. We we're singing in the Dharma dialect. Singing, and suddenly, I saw the, the strangest sight of my life. It was as if a curtain was pushed in the sky. And I saw a man sitting on a throne. He was literally glowing like the sun. That's the most beautiful morning I've seen in my life. And I saw a woman kneel down presenting a child. <laughs> when you see, see, if you see a vision, you don't, you don't even need to, people to believe. When they see their contenance, they will know you are seeing something. <laughs> you see, when, hey, when Zachariah was locked up in the Holy of Holies, suddenly he didn't come out again. A service of 15 minutes became three hours. He didn't know time has gone. The people knew. When he came out, they said, Kai, this man has seen an angel. <laughs> you know, this one, you are imagining things. You say, I've seen this. I tapped my mom. I said, look, look, look. <laughs> Before she turned, he closed off. What? There's another. See, that's why you can't. Even if I tell you now, I don't believe in Jesus. It's a lie. I can't deny it. Every day is like yesterday. You don't forget encounters. Because it is weaved into the fabric of your being. When you have an encounter, every cell in your body bears witness because it's a realm of reality. Everything about your life carries the DNA of life. When you have an encounter, you are touching the realm of life. So even the cells in your ear will bear witness. I have never believed Christianity is a religion. I come to a place if it's not happening. When I started, I'll say, sorry, this thing, let me go and learn again. I don't understand this one because I know if I know it, it will happen. I don't need to coerce people to believe. It is in the gate of alignment that we enter beyond the veil. Because until true conviction is furnished in the heart of men, we cannot deliver the kingdom. He said, the endless expectation of creation. He waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Sons of God are the men that have journeyed through the gate of alignment and come out on the other side. Satan came and said, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. The contention was all about being the son of God. Because he knew the day the son of God shows up, he loses his authority over creation. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, <laughs> Jesus laughed. If you are the son of God, he checked with Moses. This one has anger. Okay, anger will destroy the ministry, so he's not the one. Check with David. 
This one has soiled his hand with blood. He's not the son of God. So everybody that comes on the scene, he goes to check. He begins to open the gates, the gates of corruption, and he will find one. But when he came to Jesus, he said, the prince of this world come to me and find them nothing. He checked. He checked his profile in the spirit. He checked. He looked at his life. There was no gate of corruption. So he came to him. Are you the son of God? Are you the son of God? See, these are tangible things. It's not emotional. Are you the son of God? Okay, if you, if you are, turn this stone to bread. Let me see. Because he knew that an era was about to break upon the earth realm. Because the moment the sons of God manifest, deliverance is a natural flow. He knew there was an era about to break open. <laughs> and when Jesus completed the circle, as he was coming down from the mountain, the Bible said he came down in the power of the Spirit. Alignment is what clothes you with the garment of power. Deliverers are furnished within the regions of alignment. He returned in the power of the spirit and his fame went abroad. Who spread his fame abroad? He had returned. He has returned. And he said that it might be fulfilled. That which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. <laughs> These things were spoken. Jesus lived for 30 years. But he didn't touch it. Until he completed the circle of alignment. He said in the land of Zebulun. In the land of Naphtali. By the way of the sea beyond Jordan. Galilee of the Gentile. The people that sat in darkness. You see what he did was a quiet activity. By the back sides of the desert. He didn't come to row himself and shout. It was at the backside. But when the requirements of the spirit was fulfilled, he showed up as light. And he began to read his manifesto immediately. <laughs> he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. You don't need to believe. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. From this moment, anybody that is impoverished concerning spiritual realities, if I interact with him, he will come alive in the spirit. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bring sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. <laughs> oh, he began to read his manifesto. He didn't need them to believe, and the people didn't believe, and it didn't matter. He went to the marketplace and he began to open blind eyes. He began to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Why? Because he had fulfilled the requirement in the spirit. You see, we come to church, we see the display of men, but we are not schooled in the things of the spirit. What we make you most times is not in the church. It is the obedience you fulfill in the bedroom. The obedience you fulfill in the market. The obedience you fulfill in the lecture hall. That is what seeps the power into you. Because the end product of alignment is power. Demons don't speak English. Spirit speaks spirit and life. What they communicate is power. The statement the demons are making in your family, are they in articulate language? They come and they shut people down with sickness. It's power. They keep them in captivity. They come and they prevent people from getting married. It's power. The language spirits understand is the language of power. So when we yield to Jesus, what we are trying to enter is a vote of power so that we can secure deliverance unto Jacob. People spend all their lives quoting, reading things, cramming things so that they can come and give an articulate and cerebral language. And their life is a... a, a a mess because they don't understand that the language that spirits speak is power alignment is not complete until you are clothed with power it is power that will take the gospel to the ends of the earth for 30 years Jesus was an upright man but he couldn't shift anything in his territory they knew him as the carpenter but the day power came in three and a half years he did what he could not do in 30 years 
That means every year was equivalent to a decade by power. Your signature in the spirit is power. Your identity is power. We are born by power. We are ordained for power. And only by power can we advance the kingdom. He said, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who are thou? The question was not a question of nomenclature. By what authority have you come? You think when Pharaoh asked Moses, Who is your God that I may obey him? He was telling Moses to describe God. What he needed was power. And Moses showed up. 430 years of captivity was ended in a short season. Because a new language was being spoken upon the landscape. Power was beginning to play out. What is fighting the land? What has shut the land down in captivity? It's not English language. It's not Hausa. It's power. And until we arise in power, the land will remain in captivity. And we will join that alignment of captivity. Your identity in the spirit is by power. The fulfillment of your purpose is predicated upon power. That was why Jesus, who was the prototype of our lifestyle, showed us that we must first of all join into power before we begin. You think Jesus didn't know the gospel? You think there were no blind men when he was 25? There were dead men, there were barren people, there were blind people, there were deaf people. He was quiet until he was 30. He saw the blind men in the territory, he did nothing about them. Because you don't begin until you are clothed with power. So before he met the first blind man, he went through the desert. Because he knew that until the garment of power came upon him, he was not fit for the job of the master. You are the one who is going to the deaf person and doing trial and error. There's nothing like trial and error. That ear is shot by the finger of a demon. And only power can remove it. You don't advise demons, you cast them out. Who told you it's trial and error? He said, Ought not this woman, the daughter of Abraham, who has been bound these 18 years, be free? He said, Woman, thou art loosed. What he contended with was the demon that bent her over. Even the gospel you preach, nobody will hear it except as you speak it by power. Paul said, If our gospel be here, it is here to them that are lost, whom the God of this world have blinded their heart. You think you are educating the minds of people, whereas there are demons that have shut their eyes with a dark garment. Everything you say will not make sense except you begin to speak through the vote of power. Power is not an act. Everything we need to advance the kingdom has one name. That name is power. It is power that uninstalls the protocol of darkness. It is power that shut down demonic installation. The mast of heaven is open only by the gateways of power. People who are wise, they pursue after power. The reason we obey, the reason we align is because there is a kingdom that is about to gain emergence and only the sons of power can bring it to pass. If there is no power, there is no hope for a generation. Jesus didn't say when the Holy Ghost come, he will educate you. He said not many days from now, you shall receive the Holy Ghost. And power, power. He said when power comes, then you can be witnesses unto me. He said tarry here in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. Power is the code of life. Power is the proof of witness. Power is the seal of authority. It is only by power that demonic entities can shift away from eternity. Even the very gates of territories don't open except as you come by power. You say, lift up the gates. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the king of glory might come in. You say, who is the king of glory? Because darkness will challenge you. Demons will challenge you. They don't go away. You don't advise them. You don't counsel them. You cast them out by power. They will challenge you. When you come to that territory and you want to speak, the first one that challenges you is not the people. When a man holds his sword at you, just know that he's giving expression to a demonic entity. They will challenge you. They will fight you. They will attack you. They will do everything within their powers to shut you down. The only thing that will keep you going through the landscape of darkness is the seal of power that you stand upon. Every one of us must be clothed with power. If there is no power, there is no gospel. 
the very gospel that we preach he said it's called the power of God by power by power he said through the greatness of thy power shall thy enemies submit themselves to you through the greatness of thy power there is no kingdom in view except as power becomes our language except as power becomes our way of life the very utterances from your spirit must be clothed with power only by power can the kingdom advance have you been summoned by ordination there is no doubt about it but what is backing you the reason we are lying to the holy spirit is so that we can shift back the tides of darkness the kingdom only advanced by warfare that is why life itself is not a fun fair it's a warfare you will never see anywhere in, bible, in the bible where fun is articulated to life it is always warfare even the territories that god has given to you only by power can you take them he said in Deuteronomy chapter 24, 2 verse 24, he said, Arise, take up thy journey and go beyond the river Anon. He said, Behold, I have given unto you Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon. He said, Begin to possess the land and subdue him. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Even when there is glory upon you, if you don't arise, you will not shine. He said, Let your light so shine before me. You let it, let it, let it. Power is the code of life. Through the greatness of thy power, shall thy enemies submit themselves to you. In the days of thy power, the people shall be willing. We don't need counseling so much as it is made to look. What we need is power. The day power shows up, people will pursue after you. That is why the scripture, the man of God wrote, he stirred my spirit. He said, in the last day, the kingdom of God. The house of God shall be upon the mountains. He said, it shall be upon every hill. And he said, all the nations shall come. Teach us the way of the Lord. That's not evangelism. You compare them by an akazo. They compel him first. An akazo. They compel him first. The only way death can run away is when you show up with the garment of power. The garment of power. And the beauty of it is that we have it in our vessel. We try to give expression to it. That is why we are lying to the monarch of Zion. Shaka Patarabus. Power is not what you think it is. Power is your identity in the spirit. Power is the only tool by which you can advance the kingdom. The gospel you preach is power. Your DNA, your DNA is fabricated by power. You are a seed of power. Everything about you is power. He said you were born by power. Everything about you is power. You were born by power. Your reality is power. Your identity is power. Emma Casatabonia. As many as believe To them he gave power He gave power to become the sons of God He were born by power There is nothing in Christianity Outside of power Christianity is a move of power Power belongs to you For thine is the kingdom, for thine is the power, for thine is the glory, for thine is the kingdom, for thine is the power, for thine is the glory. People were in captivity for 430 years. They were begging God, they were begging God. No, 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 it's not about begging. You need a man of power to show up. Moses showed up as a man of power. And what three million people were begging God for? One man brought it by power. One man brought it by power. The church in Zaria is crying for revival. When a man of power saw, 
He will bring revival by power. In heaven and earth, Opa belongs to you. already. Let me tell you something. There is a garment of power about to clothe people now. There is a garment of power about to clothe people now. Shababaka batababot Repatoko satanika Beresko, Beresko Menta kibarasata Precious Holy Spirit Reign upon us Thank you. 
the Lord. The Lord wants to activate. The Lord wants to activate sight. Sight. Sight in the spirit. The Lord wants to activate sight. Listen, listen. The wind of the Holy Ghost will blow over this place now. And it will begin. Lord, let the ceremony begin. Shabbat. Let the ceremony begin. Let their eyes open in the spirit. Oh my casa te vele na suata. Rehe ma te comeres. Mare como sale tai camila haya bona. Ama pidas. Vele na na sina. Let the ceremony begin. The angels of sight begin to minister you. Begin to minister. The angels of sight begin to minister to you. The angels of sight begin to minister. Ani o Lift your hands. You are sick here now. Lift your hands. Meanwhile, a lot of you are already healed. A lot of you are already healed, but you still feel the symptom of sickness. Lift your hands, and you are healed. You know. Lift your hands. Come forth. Come out quickly. Come out quickly. There's no time. You are sick. Lift your hands. Come out quickly. Check your bodies. Most of you are already healed. The Lord is brooding over this realm. He's brooding over his people. He's brooding. The Lord is brooding. The Lord is brooding. Don't be separated from what is happening. Even those ministering with me, the power of God is touching them. Don't 
be separated from what is happening. You are healed now, you will know, right? Lift your hands up. Place a demand on the anointing. Ask the Lord for healing now. Instant healing. Instant. Instant healing. Place a demand now. I don't believe in trying to help God. What the situation is, ask for it now. Father, in the name of Jesus, under this anointing of the Spirit, I declare, let the chains of sickness be broken now. I command you, spirit of infirmity, holding them bound. Get out in the name of Jesus. Get out in the name of Jesus. Today, the Son of Man sets you free. I declare you free. I declare you free. I declare you free. Healed in Jesus' name. 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 Healed. Healed in Jesus' name. 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 Marabasa Baboda Labahaski. Rescue Bemos. Allow God to walk on them. Those are not the power. Allow God to walk on them. Meanwhile, go ahead. Check yourself. Check yourself. The things you couldn't do before, begin to do them. Begin to do them by the power of the Holy Ghost. Don't go back. We are taking testimonies now. It's not try and error. Check now. If you are healed, you will know. Check. The things you couldn't do before, begin to do them. Meanwhile, the Lord is anointing intercessors. The Lord is anointing intercessors now. Now, as we speak, as we speak, as we speak, the oil of intercession, the oil of intercession, the oil of intercession, the oil of intercession. I make it happen by the Spirit of God. The oil of intercession, the oil of intercession, the oil of intercession is resting on people. It's resting, it's resting. Look at that. Touch. Maria Gebosca Brenatales. The oil of intercession. The oil, the oil of intercession. The oil of intercession. Coming down densely upon this atmosphere. Touch. The oil of intercession. The oil of intercession. The oil of intercession. The oil. The oil, the oil of intercession. Malakizo Zalamandras, Berakemos, activated, activated. You will never be the same again. Today, the Lord apprehends you. Bere peres kometeka, balakasizi lagabaras kemote, beruko vevera na taburi na ata kila para babas, raga baba mu malakati ya subata. Andre Gido Zalamandras. Hallelujah! 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 your hands. I see angels dropping gifts. Angels empowering people with prosperity. 
prosperity. I see God giving some of you ideas, business ideas now. I see young ladies doing business. The Lord giving you strategies. Angels putting gifts, gifts in the hand of men. As we sing this song, the, the intensity will increase. Some of you will literally feel your hand burning. Some of you will literally feel a touch, a touch. your healing you've noticed your healing three already you are healed let me see your hand you are healed listen listen don't try to help God man cannot help God Jesus ministered to a blind man he said he saw men like three he ministered to him again don't try to do it thinking that it will happen don't encourage God if you are not healed you are not healed and we can pray again you'll be healed the power is tangible. We are not doing it. You are healed. Let me see your hand. Don't help Jesus. Those of you who have not noticed your healing. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message if you have any question please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you and also if you are watching this video and you don't know jesus christ ask the lord and personal savior i want you to make that decision just contact us in the description call us and let us lead you to receive jesus christ as your lord and personal savior and lastly make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.